Mr. Clerk, do we have quorum? Mr. Chair, there is quorum. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Administrative Policies, always hotbed of interesting discussion. And tonight will be no different. Um, the first thing we need to do is have a public meeting, this is statutory, for the item for the tax write-offs pursuant to sections 357 and 358 of the Municipal Act. And that is an opportunity for members of the public of the affected properties to get their comments on the record at this time. So I'm opening that public meeting now. If you... Yes, so this section, if there are members of the public that are not in Exhibit A, uh, they're not permitted to speak into the statutory public meeting, but when the item of business comes up in the agenda, any member of the public is, is permitted to speak. So this, this statutory meeting is only for the ones who are affected by the, the bylaw itself. Is there anyone here affected by, uh, listed in Schedule A that wishes to speak? Seeing none, I will then close the public meeting for the tax write-offs pursuant to Section 357.58 of the Municipal Act. And like I said, it will be coming up in the agenda, and at that point, we will take uh, comments from members of the public and from members of the committee. So now we call the regular meeting to order, and we need to approve the agenda. You'll notice in the agenda there's several items. The first two items are, have to do with the city treasurer and the auditor and are not related to the delegation, but the, in the order of business, the delegations usually come first. So I'm asking with the committee's approval to move the delegation, which is to speak to the item D from the agenda, to move the delegation to in between C and D so that the delegation speaks to the item right before we debate the item so that it's top of mind. So I, I need the consent of the committee to make that change. So I'll call a vote on moving item six to, yeah, so I, I guess I need a mover and seconder to move item six A to it go in between eight C and D. Moved by Councillor Coyote, seconded by Councillor Hill. All those in favor? And that passes. So then are there any other suggested changes to the agenda? Seeing none, we. Okay, so go ahead, Councillor Spell. Yes, uh, we're always making a read request home board of management. Does it have to be at the end of the agenda, or could we do it first and allow staff to leave sooner? Yes, um, the clerk is telling me that the order of the business items is, is always the same and, and published. Uh, I would suggest that if we want to make that change, we, we should probably uh, make it a permanent change and, and discuss it with staff so that it comes up like that, printed that way and then members of the public know that it's different. In addition to that, Mr. Chair, the information reports are traditionally dealt with uh, last on the agenda under business. Yeah. Yes, so there is another information report in the package and perhaps it, it could, using the same logic, also be pumped forward. So the sentiment is a good one and I agree, but uh, it is uh, this way because of the procedural bylaw. Okay, any other suggestions for changes? Okay, we'll vote. Uh, it's moved by Councillor Coyote and second by Councillor Hill on the agenda as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries. Yes, we have the minutes from April 11th. We need a mover who was present at that meeting to move the minutes. Uh, who was at the April 11th meeting? Uh, moved by Councillor Chappelle. Say, anyone can second. Second by Council Hill. So you see, you've got them in front of you. Are there any errors or omissions? Seems to be in order. Nobody has any errors or omissions. So we will vote on the moved and seconded minutes from April 11th. All those in favor? 
Opposed, and that carries. Disclosure of pecuniary interest, anyone? Seeing none. The delegation was moved to a later point. Are there any briefings? So I'm told there will be a, a presentation from staff for one of the items in the agenda, and it will come at when that item comes up, when staff introduce the item, that's when they'll make the presentation. So no formal briefings. So we're right into business. Business 8A is the aforementioned tax write-offs pursuant to the Municipal Act. It's a report from the city treasurer and the CFO, and uh, you'll see a recommendation in the package, and we'll ask for staff to introduce the item. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. So the report uh, before you tonight for the tax write-offs um, is looking for approval for tax write-offs, a total of about uh, $60,000. Um, of which the municipal share is about 45,000. Uh, the reasons are listed in the report where, where it's eligible for tax write-off and also in Appendix A gives you more detail on each of the properties. Um, the only other thing I would mention is that we do have a tax write-off provision in the budget and so these amounts will go against that provision so it won't affect uh, any further budget implications. So we now move to questions of the committee. I, I just have a quick one. Um, where it says reason for adjustment, fire, comma, demo. Uh, so that was because there was a fire at the premise and there was a, a demolition. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So if someone is renovating a property or if there's been a fire, then they're eligible for the write-off. Right, so they're not necessarily if it could be fire or demolition. Okay, that's what I thought. All right, thank you. No other questions from members of the committee? Okay, we'll go to members of the public. Questions on item 8A. Let's turn on your microphone. There, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and after the report and presentation. Um, just very briefly, um, I'm just wondering, you might be able to explain a bit more on um, the trends of this particular item, because it does appear on this committee's business regularly, say on a quarter to quarter basis and a year to year basis, because um, we're dealing with it uh, regularly, right? And was, I'm just wondering if there are any patterns that you've analyzed and that you may want to um, explain to the committee. Thank you. Are there any other public that wish to speak to this item? Seeing none, staff has a chance to respond to the questions from members of the public. Go ahead. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think just to say, so this is a recurring report. It's part of normal operations to have these write-offs. Um, in terms of the frequency of coming to the committee, it really does depend on the applications that come in and the timing of them going through MPAC as well because the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation also has to review um, and approve the write-off from an assessment standpoint. So depending on those timings is when we can bring it. We try to sort of wait until we've got a few to come in. Um, in terms of the trend, we, we try to, we have what we call, and you'll see this in the financial statements tonight, um, an allowance for doubtful accounts for our taxation. And we've been brought to this committee before where we've uh, set up an allowance for things like our big box stores where we know there's assessment appeals outstanding. And so we try to um, manage that in terms of then trying to keep the write-offs that's getting hit to, to the annual budget as, at a consistent basis as best we can. So, so it's about managing that, that budget line item each year. Um, and then, of course, bringing it to the committee as those, those write-off applications are approved and, and gathered. Great, thanks a lot. So there's a recommendation. We need it moved and seconded to put it on the floor. Members of the committee, moved by Councillor Spell, seconded by Councillor Hill. So the recommendation, so if passed, we would be recommending, as the committee would be recommending to Council, that Council approve the cancellation, reduction, or refund of taxes pursuant to applications made under sections 357, 358 of the Municipal Act 2001 totaling $60,904.81, of which $45,670.61 is the city's portion, and the amount charged back to the school boards and downtown Kingston BIA are $14,701.04 for the school boards and $533.16 for the DBIA, respectively. 
as listed in Exhibit A attached to report number AP 19-010. That's the recommendation. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any comments from a member of the committee? Seeing none, I will call the vote on this recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries. Thank you very much. Next item of business is 8B, the 2018 audited financial statements. This is also under the city treasurer, and you've got their, her report, and there's a recommendation there with two clauses, and I'll allow her to introduce the item. Thank you, through Chair. Um, so I thought I would start off tonight and just do some highlights of the, uh, the financial statements. You've had them um, to review, and I'm sure you've read them from cover to cover. Um, but I will uh, just uh, touch base on a few things that I want to bring to the committee's attention. Um, and then I'll turn it over to the representatives from KPMG tonight to go over the uh, audit findings report. Uh, but I will just take this opportunity uh, just to introduce the two folks beside me. You, you probably recognize Rebecca Prophet from previous years that she's been here. Um, and Rebecca will be doing the, the majority of the presentation tonight. Um, and then Simon Froggett, who's new to the table here, uh, who is the office managing partner at KPMG. And, and uh, Laurie Huber, Huber, who you're used to seeing sitting here, actually, I believe, is in Miami this week. And so Simon has offered to, uh, to sit in. So we told him we'd ask him lots of hard questions while he was here. Um, so I will be turning it over to Rebecca in a few minutes. So the, the financial statements that are in front of you, the first thing that I just want to mention, so these are consolidated statements. So they're more than just the city of Kingston. Um, and note one in the statements uh, outlines the agencies that are also consolidated. So they include the library, the downtown business association, um, the housing corporation, public health, as well as the utility uh, entities are included in that. The one thing that has changed this year, and you'll see there's a note, I believe it's note 22 to the financial statements, uh, talks about us now consolidating townhomes Kingston. Uh, so as a result of the changes to the governance, uh, where it's now under the service manager, under the city of Kingston, and some of the administrative models, working with the auditors, we determined that we do need to start consolidating it. So those operations have been uh, included in the, in, consolidated in the financial statements. Um, and reported retroactively, so we actually started them, they're in 2017 numbers as well, and the note references that. Um, basically what that does in terms of a scope of dollars, it added about $12 million to the assets and about $12 million to the liabilities. Very limited effect on our net municipal equity on the bottom line. Um, and again, that, that's all outlined in note 22. So that, that's the main change that I just wanted to point out in terms of the, uh, the consolidation. Um, page five of the financial statements, which is the consolidated statement of financial position. So this represents the, the resources, the economic resources that are controlled by the city. Um, and it's our financial position at that specific point in time. So at December 31st, 2018. You will notice, and I just want to point out, um, the very first line are cash and short-term investments. Uh, you'll see quite an increase there, but you'll also see farther down a decrease in the long-term investments. So overall, that cash position has increased, um, but we have uh, moved to a bit of a different strategy with some of our shorter-term monies over the last couple of years. We've been taking them out of our long-term investments and putting them into some shorter investments um, just to take advantage of some of the rate changes in the market. And so that's the shift in terms of where it's reported on the, uh, on the statement of financial position. Uh, a smaller number, but I did want to just point out the taxes receivable number, and you'll see that that's gone down by about $1.6 million. Uh, and just a couple things that have happened there, because I know that's something that people are always quite interested in, in terms of that balance. Um, definitely have about half of that has been improved collections. So we are seeing some, some positive results in terms of our collections over the last year. Um, the allowance that I spoke of earlier with respect to the write-offs is netted off of that as well. And we have increased the allowance over the last couple of years, as the committee will remember, um, with respect to some of the appeals that we have outstanding, particularly on some of our bigger retail properties. Uh, and so that also has drawn it down, and that's probably part, it's about half of the rest of that difference. So. Um, the other thing that just in the liabilities, you'll see there is an increase in the temporary loans. This is our construction financing for any of our projects that we're debt funding. 
Um, and so in that is for projects, interim financing for projects like the Central Library, the airport expansion. Um, a big part of it is the Cataraqui Bay uh, plant, uh, sewer plant. And so that's uh, temporary loans that eventually will either be paid back or turn into, into long-term debt. And then down in the long-term liabilities, you can see that we've gone down about uh, $16 million. Um, that represents our principal repayment for the year. So we paid off about $16 million. That number includes about one-third of that debt is utility-related, so paid for through rates. And there's also a small amount, and you'll, you can see that in the note 11, that relates to the agencies that we are consolidating. So they also have some long-term debt that's included in those numbers overall. So finally, just moving down, um, you'll see the, the net financial debt number. And this number basically represents the city's future revenue requirements. So this is the future revenues that we're going to need to pay off past transactions and events. The reason that's in a negative is because we have our uh, long-term liabilities above the line, but we issue debt on capital assets, and the debt side of it is below the line. So the more important number is, as you move down, once you add in the tangible capital assets of about $1.6 billion, then we have a municipal, a net municipal equity of about $1.4 billion. The, um, moving to page six, which is the statement of operations. Uh, so this is our annual surplus, and you'll see again balances down at the bottom to the, the 1.4 million of municipal equity. Um, we do show budgets here. These budgets are a little different from the budgets that council approves. Uh, we have to include the agency budgets within here, um, and we also have some PSAB adjustments that council also approves as part of budget. So they're actually, so for instance, council does not approve budget for depreciation on our assets but it's included in here as a budget adjustment because it's also in the actuals. Um, then I'd like to take you to what I think is probably the most important statement um, is on page eight, which is the consolidated schedule of municipal equity. So this is the, the city's net resources, both our financial resources as well as our capital assets that can be used to provide future services. And so this is that 1.4 billion of net equity amount. Um, and you can see it split into a number of components. So the, the first section, which is the current fund surplus deficit, this is the actual surplus that we would have reported to you on the Q4 operating report um, that came to council on June the 4th. So if you look back to that report, you will see those surpluses uh, the general operating as well as the water, sewer, and gas are referenced in that Q4 report. So those match to what I would call our, our cash surplus uh, position. The next part of our equity is the investment we have in our tangible capital assets. And so you can see again our $1.6 billion is our net book value for the tangible capital assets. And then just moving down the bottom is our breakdown of reserves and reserve funds. Um, and so those also are included in the, uh, in the total, about $279 million that makes up our municipal equity of about $1.4 million. So you can see overall our net equity has gone up from uh, 2017 to 2018. I'm not going to go through any of the notes. I've referenced a couple of them in, in my points uh, previously. Um, but there's certainly information that backs up the numbers uh, throughout the notes. So I think at this point I'll... Uh, I'll turn it over to Rebecca for the audit findings portion. Thank you. So in your package, we had pre-circulated our audit findings report. So I'll walk through some of the highlights there, starting with our executive summary. So just a reminder that our audit findings report builds on the audit plan that was presented to this committee back in November. And a reflection on any changes from our audit plan, the big one to point out um, is that we have now included townhomes Kingston in the consolidation. So we had not incorporated that into our audit planning, but based on the discussions with management and understanding the organizational structure for the city, 
we have now included that consolidation and performed audit procedures over that component. In terms of finalizing our audit at this stage, we're substantially complete other than having the discussions with the committee here today, obtaining three responses for legal letters that we send out, which is standard, and then obtaining council's approval of the statements at the July meeting and obtaining a signed management representation letter and updating procedures to the date of the audit report, which is council's approval uh, slated for July 9th. I won't speak to the second page of the executive summary as we'll cover those highlights through the body of the report. So moving on to the audit plan debrief, the basis of our audit planning report included these key items. So circling back on them, the audit team from KPMG remained consistent uh, with Lori Huber as the partner and myself as the senior manager. The team at the city of Kingston as well was as planned and they were readily available uh, for us throughout the course of our audit. Our materiality at the planning stage was set at $10 million and we had no need to change that through the course of our audit. There were no changes in terms of any significant financial reporting risks or areas of audit focus or fraud risks identified and no additional audit related work that was needed to be completed. And just a reminder that this year is the first year with the new independent auditors report and we'll speak to that as we walk through the appendices later in the presentation. The next page is a requirement that we have to speak to any critical accounting estimates within the financial statements and our assessment of these subjective areas. So the major critical accounting estimate in the city's financial statements are the employee future benefits liability. So we rely on the work of the actuary of the city, Collins Barrow, in determining this value. Uh, we're not actuaries or the accountants, so we do rely on management's expert and perform procedures over their analysis and the data that management submits to them in terms of making that calculation. So based on our procedures and review, we believe the uh, obligation is appropriate and reasonable as reported. The next slide uh, is a reminder on the data and analytic procedures we'd plan to incorporate into the audit. So an area of focus was around journal entries. So we were able to test the full population of manual journal entries throughout the year and agree the ending balance for this year to the beginning balance based on last year and look at high risk journal entries throughout the year. And we did not identify any issues or concerns and were able to complete all of the procedures uh, with our data and analytics tools. On the following slide, uh, three reminders of areas we consider through the course of the audit. The first one being around significant accounting policies and practices, and these are disclosed in the note one to the consolidated financial statements and adequately described. The second area there is around the statement presentation and disclosure uh, relative to the city's financial reporting framework and the disclosures are adequate within the statements and did include the adoption and application of some new Canadian public sector accounting standards. So we had the discussions with management and those are also disclosed in note 23 to the statements. The bottom of the page there speaks to other accounting estimates. So the critical accounting estimate around uh, the employee future benefits liability, but two other areas relate to the carrying value of the tangible capital assets and the completeness and accuracy for the accrued, accrued liabilities. And we did not identify any issues of possible management bias through the course of the audit. The next uh, two slides speak to some other matters to share with the committee here tonight. The first one being a reminder about the system conversion that took place through the course of fiscal 2017. So we had performed procedures with an IT specialist to understand the conversion and test the data as it rolled up into the new system. So we did perform follow-up procedures this year to address the changes and system upgrades over the course of fiscal 2018. As previously spoken to, we considered the consolidation of townhomes Kingston into the audit and the impact of the retroactive restatement and that disclosure is described in the financial statements. And again, the adoption of the new Canadian public sector accounting standards. 
On the following page is an item for information related to the Public Sector Accounting Board's non-traditional pension plans. There was an invitation to comment that came out in the fall, and we just wanted to keep this committee abreast of where that is going. So as it currently stands, KPMG responded to the invitation to comment to say that we agree with the proposed um, incorporation of the related benef uh, surplus or deficit affecting the municipality would be the OMERS, would be the plan that it would relate to. But we do feel that there could be inconsistent applications of this. So we are staying um, actively engaged in the development of the standard and we'll be having discussions with management as this uh, continues to develop. The following slide speaks to adjustments and differences. So again, our materiality through the course of the audit was $10 million, which is on the financial statements as a whole. So we do assess misstatements at the level of 500,000. So to the extent we had identified any differences above this threshold, we would bring them forward and we did not identify any differences that were corrected or remain uncorrected through the course of the audit. And the following slide uh, on the qualitative side of that is control observations. So we did not identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in the internal controls over financial reporting. So a good news story from the quantitative and qualitative perspective. So the balance of the report are our appendices, and I did want to focus on Appendix 1. On the first slide there, a reminder about the annual independent. So this is really the value we bring as your external auditors. And we haven't, have not performed any procedures for the city that we feel would encroach on our independence uh, over the course of the audit. And behind this slide is a copy of our independent auditors report, which is also included in the draft financial statements. So it is a clean or unqualified audit opinion. And one item to highlight here is, this is the new form under Canadian auditing standards that you will see. So the if you put this year's audit report next to last year's, it would look a little different. The audit opinion is first and at the top, and there are expanded responsibilities for management and those charged with governance, as well as us as your external auditors. And at the bottom of the first page of the audit report, it does specifically say now that those charged with governance are responsible for overseeing the entity's financial reporting process. So that wasn't specifically stated in past audit reports, although inherently uh, part of the role of governance. This year's audit report does include a paragraph related to the emphasis of matter for comparative information, so just directing readers to the note regarding the restatement uh, as described related to townhomes Kingston and the resulting adjustment. The following letter on the next two pages is the management representation letter, which we'll, we will ask to be signed upon uh, council's approval of the financial statements, and it's a standard letter given that there were no audit misstatements or deficiencies noted. It is very standard and will be asked for at the completion of the audit. And I won't propose to go through the balance of the appendices. They are there for your information, and I'm happy to speak to any of those or anything else from the audit findings report. Thank you both for your presentation. So we move to questions, questions only from members of the committee about the audited financial statements. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Three question for the treasurer. Uh, note four. Uh, in your report talks about uh, long-term investments being mainly government or financial institution bonds. What are some of the short-term investments that the city is involved in? I couldn't see reference to them elsewhere in the report. Through you, Mr. Chair. So the short-term investments are uh, mostly term deposits. Um, anywhere from, uh, I think we our lowest is a 60-day one up until about a year, so very short term. Um, and those are included up in the cash section, so there's no corresponding note. Note four um, is a requirement in terms of, uh, of reporting, um, particularly for the market value piece. So we're, we're always required to disclose what that market value is for the longer term investments, which is mostly uh, bonds. And thank you uh, for clarifying the short term. And in addition to the bonds, are there any other long-term investments that we should be aware of? 
through you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, it's mostly bonds. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any, uh, there's no equities because at this point we don't have the approval under our investment policy for equities. Um, and municipalities alone cannot invest in equities. We can do it through the one fund, which is run through um, MFOA and the LAS. Um, and we are looking at that, and we'll probably be have something coming back to the committee in the probably later this year on that. Um, but at this point, we're not allowed to do that. Uh, so it's basically just bonds and then some some term deposit type. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hill. I'm just trying to on the uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, section on adjustments and differences. So I, I'm not. I don't understand quite how you arrive at, at the materiality of $10 million. And, and when you talk about a threshold of 500000 does that mean uh, misstatements under 500000 would not be reported? So materiality is based on prior year expenses. So we can choose a percentage between 2.5 and 3%. So based on prior year expenses, we determine materiality to be $10 million, and that's been consistent over the past number of years. And the audit misstatement posting threshold of 500,000 is a calculation of 5% based on materiality. So that's standard once we've set the level of materiality. And through the course of the audit, if we had identified anything greater than 500,000, we would bring it forward and ask for it to be corrected and put it in this report. But I can say there was nothing below 500,000 either. <laughs> Thank you. I was just doing of the total budget being almost 500 million and 5% of 2% is, is 0.1 of a percent, which would be half a million. And that's the threshold. Is that correct? So we can elect to use between 0.5% and 3% on our benchmark, which could be revenues, expenses, uh, assets. And so we've used prior year expenses, which is consistent with what we do with our municipal clients, and used around the 2%. Any other questions from members of the committee? All right. So we go to members of the public. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have my points written out to assist the clerk here. I'll pass him this paper when I'm done. Um, thanks to staff and to KPMG for the report and the presentation. So I've got four points. Um, and one of them is uh, there was discussion of townhomes Kingston earlier in the presentation. And before um, the changes that were made last summer for that entity, townhomes Kingston was going to create a project at Seven Rate Crescent for which they undertook uh, fairly large expenses and that project wound up not happening. So I'm wondering if that is pinpointed anywhere in uh, the uh, report uh, so far. Second question has to do with whether the city is estimating and presenting um, detailed numbers on the deferred maintenance in the future for city properties. I know Queens does this and they actually publish it, right? They have these buildings and they know they're gonna have to spend this amount of money in the future to fix them up. So I'm wondering if the city does that and if it's anywhere in the report or if it could be. Third point has to do with um, a couple of very large uh, and costly projects that are coming up. Uh, I would pinpoint the John Counter Boulevard next phase and the third crossing. And I'm wondering if the city has an eventuality um, uh, discussed and presented on cost overruns for those projects. I know there's been concern on the third crossing especially um, since it's a very tough project to design and create. So I'm wondering if maybe some more detail on that could be presented. And then I'll, I'll just express as a citizen my concern on the overall amount of the long-term debt that the city uh, currently has. Thanks very much. Are there any other members of the public? 
Okay, so we had one member of the public who has written out his points. The clerk has them for his minute taking. Uh, Staff will have a chance to respond. Just to, to remind all uh, members present that it is only the points related to the, uh, the audited financial statements and the audit itself that are in order. So those are the questions that you can answer. Go ahead. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, and I've scribbled these down, so hopefully I've, I've caught all your questions. So first of all, with respect to townhomes Kingston, so any of the transactions that would have happened with respect to Seven Right Crescent that would have been townhomes Kingston transactions would have reported within their financial statements. Um, and then they're just rolled up and consolidated within here. So there'd be nothing specific showing within the city's financial statements, um, but any of that detail would be showing within Townhomes Kingston, which also had an audit done this year and I believe is just being finalized now. They're, they're still in draft and, uh, um, and KPMG, I believe, has done Townhomes Kingston as well. Um, your second question with respect to deferred maintenance of properties. So that is not included in the financial statements at this point in time or reported out. Um, but what I can tell you is that that is part of a much broader project that's underway with respect to asset management. Um, and so you may be aware that the province has set a new course for asset management planning. Um, and the city is, is underway. A policy did come uh, for approval to council, I think about a couple of months ago, an asset management policy, which was the first uh, deadline that the province had set. Um, and between now and I believe it's 2022 or 2023, um, there's a number of milestones that we have to meet with respect to, uh, to asset management plans, some very comprehensive asset management plans. And part of those plans will include uh, the maintenance piece of the assets. So it's more than just the asset itself, um, but as you refer to the deferred maintenance, there's the whole operational piece and how that affects the overall uh, planning of the assets. So that is being built into the work that's done now. So I would say that's a stay tuned in terms of some of that information that, that we'll have in the future. Um, the cost overruns really, there's nothing specific in the financial statements for those. Uh, neither of those assets obviously are in play right now, so they're not included within the net book value of our assets. I can certainly say in terms of cost overruns, there are contingencies within those budgets um, uh, that would certainly help to address any kind of cost overruns. Thank you. A mover and a seconder for the recommendation itself, moved by Councillor Hill. Second by Councillor Kiley. I'll read the recommendation now. So this is what we would be recommending to Council. That the Administrative Policies Committee receive KPMG's 2018 Audit Findings Report for the Corporation of the City of Kingston for the year ended December 31st, 2018, and the 2018 Audited Financial Statements of the Corporation of the City of Kingston for the year ended December 31st, 2018, and recommend as follows that council receive and approve the audit, audited financial statements of the Corporation of the City of Kingston for the year ended December 31st, 2018, attached as Exhibit A to the Administrative Policies Committee Report number AP19-009. So, it's moved and seconded. Would anyone wish to speak? Okay, so obviously a very thorough presentation and we've all read the reports, and we're happy to see, I, I'll just say on behalf of the committee, I think it's fair to say we're happy to see this type of audit come forward, and uh, I'll call the question now. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Got to find my place in the pages here. Okay, here we go. So we're now item 8C, which is the vacant unit rebate and subclass reduction programs. Another report from the city treasurer, and I'll allow her to introduce this item now. Mr. Chair. So I'm just going to, to do just a very brief history of what's got us here and just a few of the highlights. Um, because this is, I think, the third time we've been before the committee with, uh, with this issue. 
Um, so just taking you back, we did have, in reference in the report, we did have a report back in November of 2017 that had uh, the background info on the vacancy rebate program. Um, just to refresh everybody's memory, we currently have a 30% vacancy rebate for commercial taxes and a 35% vacancy rebate for industrial taxes. Um, and that's where a property is vacant for at least 90 days. So that's in place now. That program was put in place 20 plus years ago. And it was right at the time when there was uh, tax reform around the business occupancy tax. So it used to be businesses paid an occupancy tax and the commercial owner would pay the property tax. Um, the business occupancy tax was, was abolished and basically became the commercial or the industrial property owner's responsibility to pay those taxes. So as part of that, they put this vacancy rebate program into place to help when, when uh, those properties were not, um, didn't have, uh, have tenants in them, that they had this uh, ability to ask for the rebate. Um, over the last 20 plus years, certainly the assessment and tax policy has evolved, and there are some instances now where, where they are misaligned with respect to the policies. Um, so as a result of that, uh, beginning in 2017, I think actually late 2016, uh, the province came forward and said that they were going to provide municipalities with the flexibility to make changes to this program, to the vacancy rebate program. Um, and so we brought this to council and council directed us to, or to the committee, and the committee directed us to uh, do the public consultation piece, which was a requirement that the province was requiring uh, in order to uh, apply to the province for a change to the programs. And those recommendations came back uh, in November of 2018, a little bit later than we had hoped, but we really were waiting to see what the province was doing on the education piece, um, as well as some of the decisions on the other municipalities. Because at the end of the day, what the province is saying is, they wanted some consistency across the province. So we were waiting to see what they were going to do and that what some of our, uh, our counterparts were going to be doing. Um, we did at the November 18 report, we reported that as of March 18, so I apologize, this is a little old information, um, but it, we haven't, we've stopped tracking it, or certainly the groups that were tracking for us have stopped tracking, but at March 2018, there had been 46 municipalities at that point that had applied for the changes, um, and those municipalities represented about two-thirds of all the business properties in Ontario and the majority of those were either eliminating right away or phasing out the vacancy rebate. The final piece that actually is not in the report from last November um, was in April 2019. The province did confirm, and we were waiting for this information, that they are phasing out the education portion of the vacancy programs by 2020. So uh, the, the education portion, there will not be that vacancy piece um, available, and they'll be phasing it out over the two years. So the 2019 that will be paid out in 2020 um, will be half of the rebate, and then it'll be gone subsequent to that. And the province noted in the, in the uh, information that they sent, again, that the importance of the consistency and maintaining a competitive market across the province, and that was part of their decision, as well as that the decision was the majority of other municipalities with respect to the municipal, and they wanted to, uh, to have a, a line. Um, the last piece that I just wanted to mention was just in terms of our current taxation regime and some of the other things that are allowed for that also brought this issue to the forefront with the province a couple of years ago. Uh, the first thing is that MPAC, uh, Municipal Property Assessment Corp, utilizes an income-based valuation for the bulk of the city's commercial assessment base. So not all of it, but for the majority of it, they use an income base. So they look at uh, rental revenues and then their expenses. And as part of that methodology, and this speaks back to my comments that policy has, the policy regime has changed over the last 20 years, this methodology builds in a vacancy factor into those expenses. And that can be anywhere from 4% to about 10%, depending on what the type of business is. So that's something that MPAC says. So they already would build in, say, at a minimum 4% expense for a presumed vacancy. And so that, that uh, lowers the assessment value overall. 
Um, the other thing to mention is that those commercial industrial properties can apply to MPAC for a greater percentage if they have chronic vacancies. Um, and again, a greater percentage of the vacancy factor means a reduced assessment. And we have seen some examples of that within our, uh, um, some of our properties. The uh, last piece I just want to mention on that is that these properties can still apply for an assessment reduction through a Section 357 write-off. So the report you had earlier before you tonight, um, if there are vacancies because a property is undergoing renovations, um, and we, I'm not sure if we had one specific, but they would be on that re uh, report that was uh, on in front of the committee tonight, then they are eligible for a write-off at that point in time. So if there is something that's undergoing renovations. The other piece in the report does talk about the vacant and excess land subclasses. Um, the province has also begun to phase out the education portion of the vacant and excess land subclasses as well. However, we are not recommending that at this point in time. Um, we have recommended that we continue to review that. I would say there has not been as much uptake on that across the other municipalities to date. Uh, and it's something that staff would like to continue to review for possible changes in the future. That would not result in any type of budget impact. It would just be a shift across um, who's paying the total taxes in terms of the, uh, the proportion. So just to repeat what you just said, so you're saying that on vacant lands, which of course would normally not have tenants, the recommendation is, is status quo and not to phase out the, vac uh, the vacancy rebate. So they would be still eligible for the rebate. Is that what you just said? Yes, that's fair. Um, the only thing that they wouldn't be eligible for is the education portion because the province is phasing that piece out. So there'll be two different rates for the education versus the municipal. Okay. Are there other questions from members of the committee? Councilor McLaren. Is there any evidence that there might be some landowners who are holding this vacant land for too high a price so that it doesn't get developed in the hopes that perhaps in the future they might get a major windfall and as a result are benefiting from this um, subclass of uh, tax rebate? Nothing to comment on. I don't know what the motivation is in terms of some of the developers. There is certainly some land that has been vacant uh, for a while, and I think it's something that we want to continue to review to see whether or not it uh, um, there are benefits in terms of keeping it or whether it's something we need to consider to phase out. Mr. Chair, Dad, um, it is one of the initiatives that we did identify in the Council strategic priorities that we wanted to review over the next couple of years as far as a, um, a means to apply more pressure on property owners to actually proceed with some form of development on their land since we desperately need more housing. Thank you, exactly what I wanted to hear. The, the acting CAO read your mind. Do you have another question, Councilor McLaren? Councilor Hill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My understanding is that all of the major municipalities in Ontario are going in this direction. Is that correct? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. So I sit on a uh, regional single tier treasurers group, and I can tell you the majority of them have already gone there and probably went there a year ago. There are a few smaller ones that we're aware of and a couple sort of in eastern Ontario that have not gone there, but any of the larger ones, like I'd say our size and bigger and even some smaller than us, um, the majority of them have gone here. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have a question, and I think it, you've already answered it, but I just wanted to make sure I've got it correct. So the, so the, uh, so if you owned a, 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 a commercial property that you were that could be rented, we all know that commercial vacancy rates are typically higher than residential rate vacancy rates, so they're not sitting at a zero point six percent, for example. Um, that that vacancy rate on a year-to-year -year basis is built into the new calculation by MPAC, and therefore it, it renders the vacancy, the, this vacancy program somewhat obsolete. Is that correct? Yes, we would agree with that. The addition of expense that is considered towards vacant property that's built into the um, assessment for all income assessed properties. 
And so the obvious uh, question would be, and, and, and the Treasury Department is satisfied that the way that MPAC calculates that percentage into the, into the total amount is, uh, follows good practices? comment on my personal opinion of some of the methodology of MPAC, but I would say yes, generally overall. Our tax department keeps a very close eye on those assessments and how they're being calculated, particularly for our larger properties. I won't say we necessarily agree with some of the vacancy percentages that they're applying, um, but certainly we keep an eye on them and there is rationale behind them and we have a very good working relationship with MPAC so we share information and, and can go back and forth and, and argue and, and come up with sort of a, a middle ground on them when there is something we don't agree with. Um, yeah, no, that, that's fine. That, I'm satisfied with that question. Any other questions, member of the committee? Councillor Kiley. Through you, Mr. I'm wondering about the additional write-off that businesses can do? You mentioned uh, in the closing of your comments, because I'm thinking about a person who may own one or two commercial properties, and this really benefits them, whereas someone who owns many more than that, this might be uh, a disincentive, or a, rather an incentive for them to keep some of their places vacant. So could you talk a bit more about the, the additional support that businesses can apply to you? Certainly. Do you, Mr. Chair? Um, so the one thing that they can do is the Section 357 write-offs. They can ask for a write-off. That has to relate to a vacancy because of an ongoing uh, renovation. So, for instance, when a while ago the, uh, the Cataraqui Mall did a major renovation, and so they could apply for um, a write-off. And I know there, I think there's a couple of different ways that it can be done. Um, but if there is a renovation and that's creating the vacancy, then they can apply for that, for that write-off. Um, the other piece that they can do is with respect to that, that vacancy percentage. And so they may have a standard that they've agreed to with MPAC in terms of a vacancy factor. But if for some reason they have something else that they've got chronic vacancies, so chronic meaning not just one year or part of a year, but ongoing vacancies, um, and I can think of a couple of our larger businesses that have had that, particularly in the retail sector with, with the mall, one of the malls. Um, they can apply to MPAC for an additional factor. So basically a higher vacancy expense. So when MPAC looks at the income model, they'll look at the total rent uh, for all those units and then they apply an expense for units that are vacant. And so they can apply a larger percentage, more expense, lower income, lower assessment at the end okay. of the day. Thank you. And I, I just have one other quick question. It's more or less just a have you repeat a, a key point. So the recommendation speaks to phase it out over two years with a halfway point in the first year. And you said that some municipalities are phasing it out right to zero and have already done so or are doing so this year. Is it fair to say that we would then be sort of towards the um, slower to react to the provincial changes side as far as municipalities go with this recommendation, is that fair to say? Yes, that is definitely we're at the tail end. The majority of, of municipalities have already done an application to the province, and I should say that that is the next step. Um, if council approves this, then we still have to do an application to the province and get permission for them, and that application has to be in, I believe it's the 1st of August is the deadline for that. Great. I think that takes care of the committee's questions, so we'll go to members of the public. Remember to speak to the vacancy rebate program and the report. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. You can, you can root me out of order if I stray from, but I do have reasons for why I'm asking the questions. Um, so thank you for the report and the presentation. There's really a lot of detailed investigation that's gone into this. So I really appreciate that uh, com from the comparison standpoint. Um, we, in the agenda package, um, there is a letter from the BIA, which I think explains things very well. Um, from Mr. Ritchie, who certainly follows um, business developments very closely, great expertise there. 
But what I'm wondering is there's details lacking for other neighborhoods, right? There's no other, say, organization that speaks for, say, uh, businesses in, say, the West End or uh, countryside or east of the river. So what I'm wondering is if the city has information on business vacancy rates by district um, as part of your um, analysis of this topic. Because that would be very useful data to have, right? I'm not sure if you do it or if you don't do it. Um, maybe you're just doing it on terms of applications that come in. And the reason I'm going there is right now we have a housing crisis in the city and the mayor's task force on housing is addressing that in detail. And my idea is if you have suitable business locations, they could be possibly converted into residential if there's a lot of vacancies, right? That's my rationale there. Um, second question is, uh, does this cover undeveloped land as well? Um, or is it uh, only covering uh, properties where there's uh, business already established on them? And where I'm going with that is, um, there's a question and a point from the acting CAO um, on maybe the city wanting to spur uh, development or uh, progress being made on lands like that. So here's my question. Does the city have the power legally to actually spur development um, on those vacant lands? And I know this occurs in other jurisdictions in the United States. Councillor Neal is an expert on this. Your question, Mr. Okay. Dixon, but it's not to the okay. point of okay. the vacancy rebate. So I'll just uh, close by saying that I support the recommendation. Dixon. Any other members of the public wishing to speak at this point? All right, so uh, staff has a chance to respond to the questions that were uh, related to the report. Thank you, Theory Mr. So we would have information with respect to the vacancy rebates by district. Um, I don't have them with me tonight, but certainly that's, that's information that we would have available to us. Um, uh, in terms of the undeveloped land, that would be part of the subclass, uh, the excess land subclasses that I talked about, and so we're not recommending any changes to those at this point in time, so that would fall under that. They wouldn't be eligible for a vacancy rebate if it's just undeveloped land. Thank you. So, uh, we need a mover and a seconder for the recommendation. Moved by Councilor Hill, by Councilor McLaren. Recommendation being that Council approve the phase out of the current vacant unit rebate program over a two year period, such that for the 2018 taxation year, application is due by February 28th, 2019, the existing vacant unit rebate will continue to be available for the 2019 taxation year. Applications due by March 2nd, 2020. The rebate rate will be reduced to 15% for commercial and 17.5% for industrial vacant units. And for the 2020 taxation year, which are due by March 1st, 2021, the rebate will be fully eliminated. And the second clause is that council endorse the continued review by staff of the subclass reductions for vacant and excess land property tax subclasses for possible changes to align with the changes being made at the provincial level for the education property tax portion of these programs. It's moved and seconded. Does anyone wish to speak? Um, Mr. Vice Chair, would you take the chair so I can just make a quick comment? I can recognize you. I just think that I believe ta staff has thoroughly examined this. They've chosen a, a really prudent approach by having a two-year phase, uh, phase out rather than an immediate one. And I believe that that, 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 it, that in itself is a is very generous uh, uh, accommodation of, of, the, of the naysayers that may be against this change. And as far as the, the, the concept of maybe not doing it and, and opposing the recommendation, I think that that would be foolish. I think this is the way the province has changed the law and we're just, uh, we're adapting to that new reality in uh, that vacancy is calculated as we heard from the treasurer 
in a different fashion through the new policies and through MPAC. And I believe that, um, that the end result of this recommendation is correct. So I will support the recommendation. Thank you. I would do. Else wish to comment? Councillor Chappelle. Give us a proposal was originally put forward in November of 2018. Could we direct the clerk to include correspondence that came from that meeting in the, uh, in the information that goes towards council? Mr. Clerk, what is the procedure for correspondence? Um, the correspondence that was received at the November 2018 uh, meeting was dealt with by the committee of the day. Um, however, um, the committee does have an opportunity to refer correspondence to council, so we could um, send that through if that was the committee's wish. Would we need, we need a motion? So it would just be a, a motion to approve it. Then we can just refer it to, if that's the consent of the committee. It's fine. So I, just, I, I guess we'd just need a vote in favor. If you can make that motion, if you like, to, to include the correspondence from the last meeting uh, on this subject. So, it's Peter. Yeah. You can, yeah, so does the clerk have something yet? Through, Go ahead, City Clerk. Through Mr. Chair, uh, that's not a problem. We'll provide that uh, correspondence to everybody. That's fine. So we don't need a motion? You do not. Okay. We don't even need a motion. So you've just asked and you've, got, you've received. Okay, any other comments? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to call the question then. All those in favor of the recommendation? All those opposed? And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for the City Treasurer's Department for the time being. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. For the next section, I am going to sit as a regular member uh, representing Sydenham District and Councillor Chappelle, the Vice Chair of the Committee, will be the Chair. So we're going to switch spots. I'd like to invite the first delegation to discuss the Nicholas McCarney field update. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Matthew Holmes. I'm the Director of Government and Institutional Relations at Queen's University, and I'm here on behalf of Michael Fraser, the Vice Principal of University Relations. I'm joined this evening by Leslie Delson, the Executive Director of Athletics and Recreation, and John Witches, the Associate Vice Principal of Facilities. The last time Queen's was before this committee was 2017. At that time, we presented initial plans for a berm at Miklas McCarney Field. The aim was to provide a physical barrier to mitigate the impact of noise from that field, particularly for the residents on the east side of Sir John A. McDonald Boulevard. We are here today to provide the committee with an update, and I know you have also received the report prepared by staff, city staff. I will turn over to John Witches to provide some background related to noise mitigations at the field. Great, thanks, uh, Matthew. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, just a bit of background before I begin. Um, in 2014, uh, Queen's engaged HGC Engineering to do a noise impact assessment at Nicholas McCarney Field and identify recommendations for, uh, for mitigation um, for sound heading to the nearby neighbors. 
The engineer's assessment modeled uh, predicted sound levels from whistles and various potential sound system designs, and the report provided a number of recommendations, which I've included here on this slide, and we've acted on all of these recommendations. <clears throat> the first recommendation included the installation of a distributed sound system, which is essentially putting smaller speakers around the field so they can be operated at a lower volume. We also set a maximum volume for that sound system. And we required all users of that sound system to use that, uh, that maximum volume. We also had the whistles changed to a Fox Pearl equivalent whistle, which op operates at a lower decibel reading. And then we, we had the recommendation to come back and do sound testing after we'd implemented our, our changes. So in addition, we implemented a number of uh, other measures that weren't identified in the sound study. We've taken a good look at scheduling on the field. Uh, we've made a concerted effort to remove activities from the field at every opportunity, uh, moving activities into Richardson Stadium and also onto the main fields on, on Queen's campus. Uh, we've prohibited the use of air horns and other noisemakers. Um, all field users are aware of the sensitivities of sound at the Nicholas McCartney field and it's in the contract language that we have with them. Uh, we publish all of our uh, field use schedules, and we also have a hotline that's available for people to call if there are any concerns uh, with noise in the field. So in 2017, we were before this committee uh, talking about a roughly three to four meter high berm on the east side of Nicholas McCarney. The purpose of that berm was to provide additional noise mitigation uh, from the sports field to the neighbors. When we presented, uh, it was conditional upon us getting the approvals we needed and also uh, that the proposal would fit within the budget. So I show here the uh, Nicholas McCartney field and the proposed uh, berm location. Um, after the meeting with this committee, uh, Queens began working on that design. We presented that to a public meeting uh, shortly thereafter. We subsequently met with city staff and during those discussions, uh, we ran into some issues in the northeast corner of the, of the field where, where it connects uh, closely with Sir John A. McDonald Boulevard. Um, the geometry of the proposed berm uh, had it onto the, uh, the, the side of the uh, road near Sir John A., uh, the road allowance, which wasn't allowed uh, per, for the city. So the geometry of that berm didn't work. Uh, we looked at some other alternatives, including some fencing along Sir John A., uh, there were some safety concerns with that and also the fencing appeared to amplify the noise into the neighbors to the east so we haven't moved forward on that. Uh, last fall we undertook uh, a sound engineering study per the recommendations in the 2014 report. Um, you can see the three uh, sound receptor locations that we have uh, studied. We engaged HGC to do some measurements. Uh, with the, uh, the most salient uh, measurement at M1 to the east, that's where the, uh, the neighbors were most concerned. We also took measurements to the north of the field at M1 and M2. So we've shown here the, the displayed results of, of those, uh, those measurements. These were done by a field technician. These were actual measurements taken. Um, the M1 location, again, that's to the east of the field on a Sunday afternoon at two o'clock during a lacrosse game. Um, the first column there is really a 10 minute average of sound and the, the, the next column is the background noise. Uh, but the more salient column is the, the column on the right where we have sound uh, traffic sounds at 65 to 68 decibels, uh, players, coaches and fans at 50 to 60 dBA and then distant whistles at 65. Uh, if we look at uh, M2, which is again sort of northwest of the field. Um, we took a couple of measurements there, one during a football practice on a Wednesday evening and one during that same lacrosse game. Again, uh, traffic sounds are dominating the, the noise at 65 to 68. Uh, we heard some whistles, voices from coaches and players. There was a, a soccer game on at the stadium and there was some music uh, played there that was recorded at less than 40 dBA. So what we're uh, noticing with these sound measurements is the sound levels are predominantly dominated by traffic noise. We took some additional sound measurements over a prolonged period of time, uh, over an hour. Um, again, for those same two sound receptors, uh, two different uh, times. 
one during a lacrosse game and one without a lacrosse game. And you can see that the, the decibel reading is essentially the same. So the implication there is the activity on the field has really no effect on the sound level measurements that were taken. So just in closing, uh, maybe a little bit about the success we feel we've had uh, based on the results of the noise impact assessment and our, cons our consultations with the neighbors, we feel that our ongoing noise mitigations have worked relatively well for Nicholas McCarney Field. Um, over the past two years, we've only had two complaints and that was because the people using the field were using unauthorized amplified music. Two of the neighbors called, uh, we were quick to respond and at our public meeting recently, uh, those two neighbors were actually there and they, they complimented us on, they were the ones that called and they complimented us on how quickly we responded. Um, just a final uh, comment there, we will be working with the city staff to look at potential landscape improvements since we're not going to be building a berm or putting up a large fence. So we'll be working with the city going forward to come up with some ideas uh, and work together on that. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Councillor Hill. Thank you. The, the, the Nicholas uh, field, uh, that doesn't have amplified sound on it, does it? Nicholas McCartney field? Right. Y y yes. It does? Yeah, it, ha it has a sound system on it. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah. Didn't realize that. So, yes, and, we, and it's, a, it's a distributed sound system with, with small speakers around the, around the stadium. So sorry, that, is that the practice field or the main stadium? That, that's not that's the a main stadium. Field. That's that's a field we use for for competition. Okay. As well. Okay, so it does have amplified sound. Okay. Yes. Yes. And and the the same philosophy was followed within Richardson Stadium that you use more speakers that are smaller and you you place them around so you, the overall volume you can dial it right down, and I think on Richardson it made a heck of a difference uh, for us. So we use the same strategy here on this field. Okay. Thank you. I have a question about the final point of your presentation, which is also the third clause of the recommendation, uh, working with, with city staff on development of a financial contribution for creation of a pedestrian pathway. So I guess I'm wondering if you could be more specific or, or do you not know at this time, is, this, is, is the university making a commitment to a certain level of financial contribution for that pedestrian improvement? Yeah, my understanding had allocated money to build a berm. Uh, the money that's left in that allocation is still available. And so our intention is to work with the city to direct that, that available funding to whatever, um, whatever solution we come up with or whatever path forward we come up with. But we're still, it's very preliminary. We haven't had any detailed discussions about what it is exactly we would be doing there. Okay, so the follow-up would be then the, the um, administration has already approved an amount for the berm, which, but now that the berm's not being built, that money can be redirected to a, pro to a city project in, in the fashion, like that, that is a possibility, that we're not going to find that it's later down the line that it's not possible? No, that possibility. I to you that the original allocation for the berm has, has declined slightly because where there was a fair bit of design work and engineering work going into that to, to come to the conclusion that we, we couldn't build it because the geometry didn't work out. But the money that's left from that, minus that design work, is available. You have to know how much money was, is left over? Like, what, how much money are we, are we talking about? It would be, be nice to have an idea before yeah. we vote on the recommendation. Of course, I, I don't have a, I don't have, I'm sorry. Sorry, is there anyone in the public that have any questions? This is much more difficult to press than the one we have at our desks. Uh, uh, we'll move on. To, so the delegation, you're complete. Thank you very much for presenting. And uh, we'll move on to the business portion of the meeting. Mr. McLean, I think you're going to. Or, or Ms. Turner.
I'm good. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the report that you have in front of you tonight uh, is for the West Campus Noise Mitigation. Um, the recommendations are outlined as uh, the following, that staff will be directed to monitor the noise generation at West Campus Fields, um, and that staff uh, be directed to take no further action to the installation of the noise berm along the Sir John A. McDonald uh, frontage. Um, and that staff continue to work with Queen's University on the development and financial contribution to the creation of a pedestrian pathway um, through the Queen's property along the west side of Sir John A. between Union and Johnson Street. Are there any comments or questions from the committee? Uh, I get to staff, uh, having heard the presentation is it okay? Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair. So, we, we've heard the presentation from the university, and I'm wondering, from staff's vantage point, um, is this suggestion to use the use some kind to cooperate with the university and get some funding for some pedestrian improvements? Is that was that staff's um, recommend? Is like that staff's idea, or is that, is that coming from the university? Go ahead. Thank you, and. Um through Mr. Chair, so when um, when we we had meetings with Queen's University and and they actually came forward with updated information in terms of the noise uh, mitigation and some of the improvements they had made over the last uh, year or so, and the results that were coming back were actually obviously quite different than what was initially presented. So we talked about how can we still work together to make that area more um, public friendly. Um, so conversations took place and there were also identification in terms of what the city was planning to do around active transportation. So Queen's University was quite um, agreeable to work with the city and look at what we could do together and more specifically around active transportation. Um, so this is something that I think was mutual in terms of beneficial to, uh, to the community. Any other yeah, questions? Yeah, I guess to further explore, so I know that at some point recently, I was told um, by the vice principal actually that they were looking at possible uh, park improvements in that corner rather than active transportation improvements. Is there a reason why staff would prefer one over the other? Thank you, and through Mr. Chair. So we don't necessarily have a preference. What we wanted to make sure is because there are um, obviously pedestrian movements in that area, we wanted to make sure that there was a safe way for people to be able to get to the location. Um, but if it was in parks improvement or park slash pedestrian improvements, that's something we would consider. We just looked at it because we know active transportation is a, is a key uh, council priority, so we thought that that's something that could be a win-win situation. But it could be something related to park space as well, or green open space. Thank you. Any other members of the committee? Just go ahead. Thank you, Chair, through you. I was trying to determine the difference between the two sound studies referenced on page 178. Um, the first one talks about the need for a berm, and then the second one, which was in response to the aesthetic appeal and financial implications, essentially was saying that a berm isn't needed. So what was the difference between the two studies that led to the different conclusions? Thank you, through Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll start, and um, Mr. Turner might wanna add. So the the original study that was done was actually done, I, I think it was a couple of years ago. Um, I was involved at the time, and it looked at the sound impact at different points around the, the field um, and the noise implication, and that's where the recommendation for the burn came up. But there were also a number of recommendations related to how they could change the location of their speakers, for example, for amplified sound and those types of operational changes that Queens could make, which could have a positive impact to reduce the noise in the neighborhood. So 
Queens actually did go ahead and, and implemented those operational changes. And I believe they reported at some point in time during that period to council as far as some of the improvements they had made on their operations. So they did an updated noise study um, recently, more recently, to look at what was the noise implication or impact now that they had made all of these operational changes. So what came back was actually showing um, a significant reduction in noise impact in the surrounding neighborhood. And I think you know the fact that the complaints have also almost essentially uh, disappeared is, is a reflection that those changes have been very successful and that's why it was determined that the berm was no longer necessary for noise mitigation. Is it fair to say that operational changes coupled with a berm would further eliminate any p lingering problems, though they are much lesser than they were before? those structural changes were made? Through you, Mr. Chair. So based on the last noise study, I don't, I don't know that it would really make a difference at that point if there was a berm um, because of the noise impact were, were really not um, that significant or not. When you, you take into consideration, for example, Sir John A. McDonnell Road and the, the traffic noise, it probably is higher than the noise that would be generated from the fields. Yeah, that's fair, thank you. Seeing no, do I have a uh, mover? Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Kiley. I'll just read the recommendation. That the following recommendation be approved and forwarded to Council on June 18th, 2019 for consideration. The staff be directed to continue to work with Queen's University to monitor noise generation at the West Campus fields and the staff be directed to take no further action related to the installation of a noise berm at Michaelis McCarney Field along the Sir John A. McDonald frontage and the staff be directed to continue to work with Queen's University on development and financial contribution to the creation of a pedestrian pathway through the Queen's property on the west side of Sir John A. McDonald between Union Street and Johnson Street. Uh, Councilor Stroud. So, um, my, as a representative for the residents of Oak Ridge Avenue and Gibson Avenue, which is across the street from that field, uh, the general consensus in the neighborhood is as follows. Basically, this field as it is today did not exist even a few years ago. This is a new field. It's an artificial turf field which can accommodate a high frequency of use. It is being rented uh, to external agencies as well as being used by Queen's Athletics. And many of the Queen's Athletics um, leagues that they're parts, part of, uh, we've come to realize those leagues uh, require amplified uh, music to be played during the sporting events, and this field is used for sporting events. It's important that when discussing this that we keep the um, concept of Richardson Stadium and this field separate. Richardson Stadium was redesigned in a way that is much friendlier to the surrounding area uh, and can accommodate larger events. The, this field on the corner is, uh, has bleachers and, and its main uh, source of, of friction I, I, with the neighborhood is the fact that it is in such close proximity to the backyards of the residents of o o Oak Ridge Avenue. So in the summer months when the field is in use, at its peak use, the, uh, the fields are used in the evening uh, and there is amplified uh, sound in, involved, uh, which we will see at the point when we vote on noise exemptions. And, then, and so these residents, you know, we're trying to in, in enjoy their backyards are having an issue with the frequency and uh, occurrence of this, of this amplified sound coming from the speakers. There have been improvements made. The, uh, the assertion that perhaps the uh, complaints be are less frequent and therefore the problem has been resolved, I think is inaccurate. I'm still receiving complaints. I heard complaints when I went door to door in Oak Ridge, but uh, 
there is a bit of a, of a resignation that exists in the residents where they've complained before, they've gone to public meetings before, they feel like the university is not really listening. Although there, it, I can see the university is making an effort to try to find a solution, it, it's not fair to say that the problem has been resolved. Uh, so with that in mind, how do we find a positive outcome is really the question. So we've got a recommendation here, uh, fairly specific, except for the third clause, which, as we heard from Mr. Witches, um, very generously, uh, the university, which has already allocated funds, has some funds left over, we're not sure how much, that maybe can, can, can go towards a, a, a pedestrian improvement there uh, for active transportation, as we heard from our acting CAO. The question in my mind would then be, is that any kind of consolation to the people whose, whose uh, children and, and a piece of, piece of quiet of their backyards is being disturbed by the amplified music coming from Nicholas McCartney Field? And I would say it would have to be an improvement that they would use. So are the residents across the street going to be using a pathway on the other side of Sir John A to go from Johnson to Union or vice versa? Possibly. But I, I, I don't know unless I ask them if, if, whether they consider that to be a useful um, contribution. And so the other uh, thing that was proposed during this whole process was the idea of park improvements to sort of make some of that corner space near uh, University or near Union uh, Johnson and Sir John A, which is north of the field, to, be, to make it somewhat more usable for members of the public. Very, again, very generous offer by the university if it was done. I, I, I have not specifically gone door to door asking those residents of Oak Ridge what they think about that, but that might actually have more of an upside to them. So all that in mind, I basically want this to come back to us when we have a better idea what the university and the city have come up with as a partnership. Uh, so maybe we need to add a clause uh, that, that asking staff to report back with details of that, um, of that uh, possible improvement is, is sort of what I'm thinking as, as an amendment. So maybe uh, I could just quickly ask the CAO uh, if, if she knows what I mean, and if before I write out an amendment, whether staff would be willing to work with the university and report back to this committee with details of agreement when it is identified. Oh, sir. Um. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> so, um, yes, absolutely. We, uh, we would be uh, pleased to report back to council with more detail, uh, and if the university has other options that they'd like to propose based on maybe feedback they've also heard from residents, we're also open to that. Um, so we can report back to council with more details. So I'm gonna write out a quick amendment, basically that's, I'll need a seconder, that uh, staff report back with details. It's a point of, of order. Do, do we require an amendment for that or is that just something that city staff can commit to? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we can actually just go ahead and do it, but if you'd like to have it on the record, so in eight months from now, it's still on the record or X number of years from now, it is still noted on the record, you can do that. So you do have that option. I, I saw Councilor McClellan seconding your, your effort. It, it'll be quick once, I've, I've got to get half written out. The staff report back with details of the project and um, to, to administrative policies. Do we need a timeline? Or, I mean, you'll know, right? I mean, once, could be, should I leave it open or would you like a specific timeline? Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I would prefer if it could be open because I, I know we would want to see our active transportation implementation plan come back first to committee and then council and then be able to have more conversation with the university. If it, so if it could be open, that would be preferable.
Yes. So, um, so, it, so it would just not specify the time. So it just says that staff report back with details of the project to administrative policies once known, or is that, that's, that's understood, I guess. Yeah, just leave it at that. That staff report back with details of the project to administrative policies. Is that okay, Mr. Zegner? Okay, that's my amendment. Any discussion, or can I call the vote? Call the vote. Those in favor? Okay. I recognize you and we return the chair to you. So that was on the amendments. Hold on to the chair. Uh, right. Any comments on the motion? Okay. I just want to uh, wrap up my comment. Direct, um, directing just to, to the officials from Queens that thank you for your generous offers of trying to find a positive resolution to this. And if um, a project is identified that could be appealing in some way to the residents of Oak Ridge, it would make my job a lot easier going to them and trying to obtain consensus that the university has gone above and beyond to try to put this issue to a positive conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call a question. All those in favor? Thank you. I'll return the chair to you, Councillor Stroud. Thank For your service, Mr. Vice Chair. So what do we have left on the agenda? We have eight E and F and G, and some correspondence. So, eight E, yes, we'll take a two minute recess uh, bathroom break and then we'll deal with E, F and G. Okay, that was a lot longer than two minutes, so let's get right back to work. Item. E, which I understand has a presentation from staff, revised election sign bylaw, a bylaw to regulate election signs in the city of Kingston. So there's a PowerPoint presentation apparently, Mr. Clerk, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity to present our report uh, dealing with the election sign bylaw. There are a number of staff that are with me in attendance from both the clerk's department and the planning and licensing uh, department, and we're all here to support uh, our report, our joint report going forward. So for just some background, on August uh, 7, 2018, council passed a motion directing staff to thoroughly review the election sign bylaw with public input and to clarify the policy of election signs on public property and to clearly restrict election signs bordering municipal parks and cemeteries. In addition, staff was also directed to present an amended election sign bylaw to the Administrative Policies Committee no later than Q2 2019, and that's why we're here this evening. So the purpose of our briefing tonight is to present a summary of the public input that was received with respect to the city's existing sign bylaw and the proposed amendments thereto, to summarize the recommended amendments to the election sign bylaw, and thirdly, to present a new sign bylaw in accordance with the council direction. Council also directed staff to obtain public input with respect to the election sign bylaw and any proposed amendments to the bylaw. Opportunities for public input include an open house, which was held on April 30th, uh, as well as an online survey on Get Involved Kingston webpage that was active from May 1st to May 15th, and that generated approximately 204 responses. The online survey was comprised of 11 questions and afforded the opportunity for respondents to provide additional comments on question one, which read, do you support the use of election signs in Kingston? And to provide any further comments specific to election sign bylaw. Approximately 59.8% of the survey respondents supported the use of election signs in Kingston. 54.4% of the survey respondents felt that the existing sign bylaw does not adequately control the placement of election signs in Kingston. 
Other results of the survey questions will also be referenced throughout this presentation. There were a number of recurring themes in addition uh, to the comments which were submitted. Those who supported the use of election signs stated that election signs provide name recognition for candidates and third party advertisers, something that is particularly important for new candidates who may not be as well known as the incumbent. Election signs may also encourage electors to do research on the candidates or the election issues and can also raise the visibility of the profile of the election across the community. For others, election signs represented an abundance of roadside clutter, uh, better known as sign pollution, and a, a distraction to motorists, cyclists, and pedestrians. Others will argue that election signs are not environmentally friendly and express concern about the waste they may generate. Others noted that election signs are not particularly useful in terms of the information conveyed. Some of the other recurring themes included that election signs should be banned, something we can't do. Election signs should only be allowed on private property. Election signs should be 100% recyclable. There needs to be fewer signs overall and less cluttering of signs and clustering as well. Election signs should be removed in a timely fashion and election sign bylaw needs to be enforced. All of the comments that we received are attached to the staff report uh, which you have before this evening. I am now going to pass over the presentation uh, to Mr. Wallace, who will speak to the related amendments to the sign bylaw. So in terms of the actual amendments to the bylaw, there was specific direction from council to clarify the intent with respect to election signs on public property. And as already mentioned, to restrict signs adjacent to parks and cemeteries. So in order to clarify the intent for signs within the road allowance, uh, a number of amendments to the bylaw are being recommended. The first is to add a new general provision to the bylaw, which would clearly indicate that except for signs within street allowances in accordance with the bylaw, election signs are otherwise prohibited on public property. 51.5% uh, of survey respondents felt that signs should continue to be allowed in the street allowance. Another one of the recommended provisions is to provide a new clause in the bylaw that actually consolidates all of the provisions related to signs within the street allowance into one single clause in the bylaw to make it easier to find and access all of those provisions. Finally, another uh, clause is proposed, a new clause is proposed to the bylaw, which would basically reiterate the general provision to, to clearly indicate that except for signs in the road allowance, signs are not per permitted on any public property. To assist with the interpretation and enforcement of the bylaw, a number of diagrams are proposed to be added. Uh, these diagrams were actually prepared as part of the 2018 election and provided to all candidates and third party advertisers. And those diagrams, which would not actually form part of the bylaw, but they would clearly show where signs are permitted and where signs are prohibited in the road allowance. In terms of parks and cemeteries, because signs are not permitted on any public property, staff is of the opinion that signs in the road allowance should not be permitted to abut any public property, not just parks. So a new clause is being added to that effect. And in terms of cemeteries, a new clause is being added to clearly restrict signs abutting a cemetery in the road allowance, no election signs on a cemetery, and no election signs on a property that abuts a cemetery. In terms of other related amendments to the bylaw, uh, again, this is to en enhance interpretation and uh, enforcement and to clarify the provisions respecting election signs. A number of new and revised definitions have been added to the bylaw, and these include definitions for travel roadway, traffic island, median strip, and site triangle. One of the reasons for adjusting the definition for site triangle is that it's problematic because the way the bylaw is worded now, it requires the dimensions of the site triangle to be measured along the street line, which is essentially the, the uh, dividing line between the actual road allowance and the property abutting property. And that street, align, street line is almost impossible to identify on the ground. So the proposed amendment would clarify that the dimensions of the site triangle 
are to be measured along the curb line or the edge of pavement of the road, which is easily discernible in the field, and that will make enforcement and interpretation of that provision much easier for campaign teams as well as for the bylaw enforcement officers. And one of the diagrams that's attached to the bylaw clearly shows the provisions for the uh, site triangles. In terms of the timing for the placement and removal of election signs, no changes are being recommended at this time. So signs can still be placed uh, following the writ of election for a provincial or federal election and within 30 days prior to voting day for a municipal election. And all signs for any election must be removed within 96 hours after voting day. 69.1% of the respondents to the survey supported or felt that those timelines were appropriate. So as I mentioned, no changes are being proposed. There are some recommended changes with respect to election signs on campaign offices, and we'll talk about those in a, in a little bit. And with respect to signs on private property, staff are recommending that a new clause be added that makes it clear that for signs on private property, it is the responsibility of the owner or occupant of the property to make sure that those signs are removed in accordance with the timelines as set out in the bylaw. As part of our uh, analysis of best practices in other municipalities, a number of municipalities prohibit the placement of election signs between a sidewalk and the traveled roadway. And this is something the staff feel would help to mitigate potential impacts to safety, uh, visibility of motorists, cyclists, and pedestrians, uh, avoid some potential distractions, and would also help in addressing the visual clutter that has been experienced along the streets. This would be a straightforward regulation that is easily understandable by campaign election teams and is something that would make enforcement of the bylaw much easier for enforcement staff. 68.1% of the survey respondents supported prohibiting election signs between a sidewalk and the traveled roadway. It is noted that if there is sufficient space in the road allowance, signs could still be placed on the opposite side of the sidewalk away from the traveled roadway or alternatively, signs could be placed on private property on the other side of the sidewalk. In order to control the number of election signs, and this is something that a number of the respondents to the survey talked about, uh, some municipalities actually require a minimum separation distance between signs for the same candidate or for the same third party advertiser. And staff is of the opinion that requiring such a minimum separation between signs would help to ensure more equitable access for all candidates and third party advertisers. And it would also help to minimize the visual clutter that was experienced along street frontages and particularly at intersections in the last election. The minimum separation distance would apply not only to signs on public property, but also signs on private property. And 78.1% of survey respondents supported having such a separation distance in the bylaw. It's noted that one municipality actually requires a higher separation in the rural area, 50 meters, but staff are not recommending that uh, due to the fact that we do have a number of hamlets and a number of estate residential subdivisions along Highway 2 where there is a concentration of electors and the 50 meter separation may be a bit of overkill in those circumstances. There's also a further option to introduce the separation distance from all election signs, but again, staff is not recommending that as there is the possibility that it could result in limiting the areas where signs could be, could be placed for a number of candidates or third party advertisers. In terms of voting places, there were issues in the last election with signs being placed too close to voting places on both advanced, election, advanced voting day and voting day. The existing bylaw does prohibit signs in a voting place and that has been interpreted in the past to include, include the entire property where the voting place is located, as well as any abutting streets. In order to implement the provisions of the Municipal Elections Act and clarify the intent of the new bylaw, a new clause is being recommended that prohibits signs on or in a voting place and within a street allowance that is opposite, adjacent to, or within 50 meters of a voting place, or a place where the administration of election processes are conducted on both advanced voting day and voting day. In addition, the definition of voting place has been revised to clarify the intent 
that it does include the entire property where the voting place is loco located and any boundaries, including streets. Establishing a minimum separation between election signs and a voting place was supported by 81.9% of the survey respondents. It is noted that this provision would only be applicable on advanced voting day and voting day. At any other time when election signs are permitted, signs could be located closer than 50 meters to a, a voting place. With respect to campaign office election signs, candidates and third party advertisers are permitted to start campaigning and distributing their campaign literature, accepting contributions and making expenditures once their nomination papers have been filed or they have registered with the clerk. A number of municipalities allow the signs on campaign offices much earlier than within 30 days and staff are recommending that campaign election signs should be permitted once the candidate has, has filed their nomination papers or once the third party advertiser has registered. In staff's opinion, this provides a reasonable and appropriate means for identification for candidates and third party advertisers, giving them some, some name recognition and public profile earlier in the campaign. This amendment was supported by 47.1% of survey respondents, 45.1% did not support the amendment, and 7.8% were not sure. In addition to the foregoing, the proposed recommendation is that these signs on campaign offices only be allowed to display the name of the candidate and the location of the uh, campaign office, and in the case of a provincial or federal election, would also allow the party name and party logo to be displayed. The candidate or third party advertiser would also be required to designate only one building or part thereof as the campaign office where the election signs could be provided earlier. And they would have to advise the clerk of that address in writing. During the 30 days prior to the election, other election signs could be placed on the campaign office property in accordance with the regulations of the election sign bylaw. Vehicle election signs are currently per permitted, but they are prohibited within 50 meters of a voting place on any advanced voting day or voting day. Similar to the pr other provisions being recommended for the bylaw, staff would also recommend that this provision be amended to include the prohibition in relation to any place where the administration of election processes is being conducted. Since election signs within a street allowance, there are certain restrictions such as a minimum uh, setback from the edge of the road uh, for a vehicle sign. They were adding, recommending a new policy be added to clarify that if a candidate or a third party advertiser has a vehicle sign, that sign is allowed to be on the city streets in accordance with any other bylaw regulations. A new clause would also prohibit vehicle signs from being parked on any public property or on any cemetery. The existing sign bylaw is currently silent on the matter of election signs on private property. Staff is recommending that election signs on private property should be subject to the same regulations as signs within the road allowance with respect to such matters as the setback from the traveled roadway, that there be no signs within the site triangles, uh, subject to any size, size or height restrictions, and that there be no signs within 50 meters of a voting place. 72.1% of survey respondents supported having election signs on private property subject to the same regulations as the signs within the street allowance. Some of municipal bylaws also restrict the number of election signs that can be placed on private property. Staff is recommending a maximum of one election sign per street frontage, per candidate or registered third party for residential properties, and two election signs per street frontage, per candidate or registered third party for non-residential properties. So basically what that means, if there are residents or occupants on a property that support different candidates, if it's a residential frontage, they could each have a sign for that the candidate that they support, and the same for signage on non-residential properties. The Municipal Elections Act was amended in 2016 to include a new provision with respect to the display of election signs in condominiums, apartment buildings, 
nonprofit housing cooperatives or gated communities. So owners or tenants of units on those properties are allowed to have election signs, but they are subject to any reasonable conditions on the size or type of election sign that may be imposed by the condominium corporation, the landlord, or the cooperative. And it's recommended that a new clause be added to the election sign bylaw to account for that new provision in the Municipal Elections Act. In terms of the size of election signs, the existing bylaw has no regulations in terms of size. Most of the election signs in the 2018 election were the typical lawn or boulevard signs, approximately half a meter by 0.7 of a meter in size, double-sided and mounted on a, an H, a metal H frame. The larger signs were typically found at intersections or on public property, and they were approximately one meter by two meters and were usually mounted in a wooden frame. The larger signs would have been those found on a campaign office. Staff is recommending that election signs in the city of Kingston, except for campaign office election signs, billboard signs, and vehicle wraps, be restricted to a maximum size of one meter by two meters and be no more than 2.15 meters or seven feet above ground level. This is considered to be consistent with what appears to have been past practice in the city in previous elections. And it is also consistent with the overall overall objectives to provide a reasonable and appropriate means to identify candidates and third party advertisers and also minimize impacts on nearby property and not create a distraction or safety hazard and protect and enhance the aesthetic qualities of the city. Establishing a size limit for election signs was supported by 71.1% of the survey respondents. Most bylaws have a number of, have general provisions which apply across the board and staff are recommending similar to a number of other Ontario municipalities that a number of general provisions be included in the bylaw to enhance interpretation and enforcement. And these general provisions would cover such things as all election signs placed in the city of Kingston must comply with the sign bylaw, the election sign bylaw. Any signs placed by the city or the provincial or federal governments uh, to provide information about elections would be exempt from the election sign bylaw. Election signs for a municipal election must be placed within the boundaries of the electoral district where the candidate is running for office. Election signs can only be placed on private property with the consent of the owner or occupant. Election signs are not to be removed without the consent of the candidate or third party advertiser or the owner or occupant of the property unless provided otherwise in the bylaw. Election signs are not to be willfully defaced or damaged. Election signs are not to be left in a state of disrepair. Election signs are not to be illuminated except for campaign office election signs or billboard election signs and election signs cannot contain any logo, trademark, crest, or other official mark that's owned or licensed by the City of Kingston. The current election sign bylaw does provide for the immediate removal of unlawful election signs without notice by a provincial offenses officer or any other person designated by the city clerk. For the 2018 election, procedures were established for the re removal of election signs and these were communicated to all candidates and third party advertisers. The new election sign bylaw maintains the authority for enforcement officers or any other person designated by the clerk to remove unlawful election signs. And the procedures that were established in 2018 are being attached to the bylaw for information purposes. Notwithstanding those procedures, on both advanced voting day and voting day, Unlawful signs in proximity to a voting place shall be immediately removed by an enforcement officer or a designated election official. A new clause 18 in the bylaw sets out the applicable offense and penalty provisions. Any person who contravenes the provisions of the bylaw is guilty of an offense and upon conviction is liable to a fine of not more than 10,000 for a first offense and 25,000 for a subsequent offense. So that doesn't mean if it gets that far in the process that that's what the, the fine is going to be. It's basically up to the courts to determine what the amount of the fine would be. And finally, in terms of bylaw information sessions, 
Staff are recommending that in order to assist candidate and third party advertiser campaign teams and the public to understand the provisions of the election sign bylaw, that an information session be held following nomination day for any municipal election or by-election and prior to the writ of election for all federal and provincial elections and by-elections to explain the election sign bylaw and the rules with respect to the placement of election signs. The intent of these sessions would be to educate campaign teams and the public and thereby minimize the number of complaints about unlawful election signs and the need for removal of unlawful election signs. And that completes our presentation, Mr. Chair, and we're more than happy to answer questions. Thank you. I see Councillor Hill is ready for the question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for your presentation and, and the hard work that obviously went into this. Could you go back to the slide that has at the very top 51%, uh, I think it's support for signs on a public, uh, There it is, right there. So 51.5% of survey respondents felt signs should continue to be allowed in a street allowance, but not near a polling station, not near a park, not near a uh, 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 cemetery. Oh, cemetery. Uh, and they need, to be, they need to be spread out quite substantially more than they were before. I, I, I guess my question is, Although it sounds, <laughs> it sounds as though people support the use of signs, it doesn't sound as though they support the use of signs on public property. Would, you, would, would that be a fair assessment of sort of what the data that you've collected uh, would support? So essentially the question was, should election signs continue to be permitted within street allowances subject to regulations? Example, minimum setback from the traveled roadway. So 51.5% said yes. 35 point, or no, 44.1% said no. 3.9% were unsure and one preferred not to answer. So it's just pretty, over. It's a pretty even split. Yes. And, and, but, they, but they certainly seem to be general support uh, for all the other restrictions. They were sort of in the range of 70% and upwards uh, supporting those other restrictions that you talked about. Yes, except for the one about campaign signs. That was pretty close. Right. So I, I guess the, 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 the question uh, would be that if, if the sentiment of the, of the community is that they not be on public property, and we have so many restrictions around that, and it's costing a significant amount uh, of, of time and effort and probably money re with respect to bylaw enforcement, uh, why would we not want to just restrict signs stri to private property? Put those regulations in that you talked about that apply to public property, but, but leave it at the level of public property. Do you think that there would be a public outcry over that? Based on the comments that we received and what we've gleaned from other municipalities, uh, there certainly is a lot of support for election signs and for support for election signs on public property because it does provide basically an equal opportunity for all candidates, all third party advertisers to have a space where they can place their signs to gain re name recognition. To restrict signs on public property uh, and only allow them on private property, the feeling, part of the feeling is that that would give the incumbents a definite advantage because they're already well known in the community. So there may be more of an appetite for homeowners or occupants who know the candidate to allow them to put a sign on the property, whereas that may not be the case for a new candidate. And then just one last sort of follow-up to that. So is that, is that conjecture or that based on the, on the evidence that you gathered from the community? It's actually than evidence. Thank you. Councilman McConnell. Thank you. If I heard you, um, we're allowed one sign per candidate on any frontage and we're also allowed no more than 10 meters between signs of the similar candidate. In the event of a row house with, uh, say, driveways that are less than 10 meters apart, uh, and there's two residents there who may want to sign, which one of those two bylaws would apply? So if it's a series of, and I'm not sure, it depends on what the lot width would be, 
but that separation distance would apply for signs for the same candidate. So there could be one out in the road allowance in front, and then if somebody wanted to put one on their own property for the same candidate, unless it was 10 meters away from the one in the road allowance, they wouldn't be permitted to do that. Road allowance on next door neighbors. So if you have one house vintage of uh, say 20 meters, but say 10 of that is, or 15 of that is the driveway, there's five left on the lawn sign and on the other, or on the lawn, and the other one adjacent to it is also similar, such that there's 10 meters of grass space to put a sign on, and there's two homes there, it seems that there could be a contradiction. It's not, a, I don't think it's a contradiction unless there's 10 meters between where the signs are placed, otherwise they wouldn't be permitted. So just to be clear, in such an event, uh, you would have one on any, on, on, a resi on one resident's house in that case. If the only areas to place the signs on both properties were within 10 meters of each other, that's correct. I have a question about the sidewalk uh, rule. So could we have just the, the slide that shows the graphic of the road and the sidewalk? So if I understand this, change the bylaw so that that boulevard section in between the sidewalk and the road, which I agree was abused in the, in the last couple of elections, no signs at all. You can put signs on the other side of gravel shoulder as long as it's two meters from the traveled roadway, which is the pavement. And you can put signs right beside the sidewalk as long as it doesn't interfere with pedestrian traffic. So that's my question. So it could be just like six inches away from the sidewalk as long as it's two meters away from the pavement of the traveled roadway. Is that correct? Yes, that would be correct. Okay. I know, I know from experience those signs will get kicked down. Um, the, the question, well, this is questions only, so uh, it's more of a comment, but I'm saying that it requires that people have in their mind a difference between different kinds of roadway, the, the vehicular portion of the roadway and the active transportation portion of the roadway and it could easily lead to uh, misinterpretation. Okay, any other questions? Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Three. Thank you for the clarity. Pounding signs in eight of the last eight elections in the city. This is very helpful. I do have a question about the site triangle. Um, 15 by 15, that makes quite a space. That means that most intersections, if we're following the letter of the law, wouldn't be able to have signs. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, that would be the case, particularly in like residential neighborhoods. So unless there's an extremely wide road allowance, uh, if you look at the diagram on the screen, signs would not be allowed within that area that's shaded blue. So in all likelihood, many of the signs that were in intersections in the past election were probably unlawful. Right. And because of that, and because of some of the new restrictions, uh, should this bylaw be passed, similar to Councillor Hill's uh, questioning, I'm wondering about enforcement. If there's an expectation that we will be able to apply many more staff hours, et cetera, et cetera, to ensure that these bylaws, if they go through, are actually enforced. Yes, go ahead. For you, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, we will have our bylaw enforcement officers are actually have zones. So there are um, approximately uh, six to seven enforcement officers that are assigned to City Central. And then we have two or three assigned to the west and a couple assigned to the east. So the expectation will be with this new bylaw if it's passed that, yes, they will be out there um, enforcing. Uh, uh, the aspects of the bylaw. Thank you. And question for now, again, in a similar vein as Councillor Hill, is it fair to say that if we were to ban public property signs, there'd be much less of a need for bylaw officers to be enforcing rules of either the existing bylaw or an altered bylaw uh, should it go forward as such? 
Through you, Mr. Chair. The majority of complaints that come in are on public uh, property. We do still see some of the site triangle um, in subdivisions, um, and we do receive complaints, obviously, um, vehicles having trouble seeing at, at intersections, but the majority of complaints that come in are, are about public property, yes. Thank you. Well. I have a couple of questions, but the first one I, I will look at it is this triangle. So we've offered some clarity tonight that if I had a row house that was on that intersection and the property is close to the curb, the sidewalk, say six feet to the sidewalk, sidewalk, and then the curb, much like it's available on Crossfield Avenue. And the, I'm thinking specifically the intersection of Crossfield and Anderson. With your site diagram that you're demonstrating here with 15 meters, there would be two residential properties side by side that would not be able to put up a sign because it would fall within that, that site line perimeter. Even though if you do the angle, you're going to be going through someone's house. Is that what you're telling me? Or is this for a wide open intersection? Because if this is demonstrating to me that you cannot have the house on the corner cannot have a lawn sign because it'll be within that blue triangle. That's the way you describe it. You're telling me I cannot have a lawn sign there. So my neighbor that has the corner lot cannot have it. And if he had put it, I can't put one for 30 feet, 30 for three feet, 10 meters. So my two other neighbors could not. So on a row of six houses, and if I had all six that wanted up a lawn sign, they could only really put maybe three at most. In answer to the first part of your question, I mean, that 15 meter site triangle, I mean, that's already a provision in the existing bylaw. What we're doing is trying to clarify and make it easier for campaign teams and bylaw enforcement officers to interpret and enforce that provision by making it the measurements along the travel portion of the road, not the street allowance, which you can't find. So, yes, within that blue triangle, signs would not be permitted and likely in some residential subdivisions that blue triangle may in fact run through the middle of a house because of the way the lots are set up. Okay, so you're disenfranchising a resident that may wish to demonstrate their, their civic duty and right to present a lawn sign case and you're also disenfranchising the other electorate uh, that has a lawn that's similar and very close. I'm glad you clarify that for me. So the triangle process if there, was no, um, if there was no public property, if there's no public property involved, and this is solely on private property, could you remove the triangle sight lines? No, because the sight triangle for a safety reason, it's to make sure that there are no signs that obstruct drivers or pedestrians or cyclists in using, when they're using the roadway or the adjacent lands. Has anyone who has written this proposal in this full election? Councillor yeah, Spell, that, that question is... Okay, I got many more. You are proposing that you're looking... So basically we've had a... Um, you, you, you use a, a great deal of weight on the public consultation. But in this public consultation, there were 83,608 people eligible voters. Only 34,529 voted, which is 41.5%. We had 205 responses to the surveys, which represents 0.002% of the eligible voters. 0.002%. So, of the people who are most directly impacted by this, I would like to know the names of any any current or past councillor, any current or past candidate, any provincial or federal Point of past order. candidate. Point of order. No. I don't think the topic that we're having here, the naming names in this situation is not uh, appropriate yeah. to this conversation. Yes. So I'll say this as chair, uh, you're, you're asking a question, but it's not a question related to the information that's in the report. Okay. Is that information not in the report? Sure. So that question is not in order, uh, and it's questions only that are in order, so you're correct about the so, question part. But you need to be asking questions for clarification, because we are going to debate this. 
And we are going to rule on it, and we're going to recommend to council something. So you're really asking to get the report clear in the committee's mind before right. we deliberate. So in regards to the points of approximately 75 to 100, that's a variance of 25 complaints. So there could be as little as 50. So how many actual complaints during the election did you receive from the bylaw office perspective? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, for the municipal election, it was, um, I don't have the number with me, but it was somewhere in, I think it was around 80 to 85. Okay. I'll give you one more question for now, because another round after, but you've got one more question on this round. Okay. The separation of 10 meters between signs, as far as I could see from the report, it was only London that had 10 meters. What other distances were offered through the other uh, communities? I see that there are numbers of uh, provisions that you mentioned, as many as 13 communities had these provisions, but I only saw London for the 10 meter separation. There were only municipalities, as I recall, that actually had a separation distance between signs. The other municipalities used various other means to control the number of signs, whether it was an actual number or limiting the distance from intersections or limiting the distance from such things as a pedestrian traffic signal or something of that nature. Okay, so I saw Councillor Hill. This would be the third round of questions. Before we go to Councillor Hill, though, is anyone that's only gone once have any questions before we go to a third round? Yeah, no, did you not go twice? Okay, so Councillor Schwell, I'll come back to you before we go to Councillor Hill. Councillor Kiley. Very quick, thank you, through you. Appreciated how you showed the different jurisdictions and the different considerations they took for all the different pieces of the bylaw. That was very helpful. One thing I didn't see, and maybe I missed it, is are there any jurisdictions in Ontario that had an outright ban? So we've talked just a moment ago about the potential for public property ban, but what about no lawn signs, no signs of any nature in a campaign. Does that happen in Ontario? So no municipalities that have an outright ban on election signs, and we did run that by our legal department uh, because a number of respondents to the survey did suggest an outright ban. And from a legal perspective, an outright ban is not possible. Thank you. A quick follow-up to that. Uh, a monetary fine, a possibility for penalizing uh, infractions on this bylaw? So the by new bylaw does contain the, the provisions for a fine, and perhaps enforcement can comment on it more, but I mean, basically by the time, to get to a fine stage, there would have to be some pretty blatant uh, contraventions of the bylaw on a continual basis that, based on the information that we've had and discussions that we've had, Bylaw prefers to use a more friendly enforcement approach first. So the provisions that were established for the last election, for example, if there was a, an unlawful sign was, if there was a complaint, the bylaw officer would get in touch with the, either the candidate or the third party advertiser, advise them of the complaint. Uh, they had 24 hours to react. If they didn't, there was another 12 hours given for them to react before uh, something else would happen. And maybe bylaw can, elaborate further. Ms. Turner. Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Wallace is correct. Our, our enforcement strategy is always a proactive, try to get it through friendly enforcement, try to get compliance through friendly enforcement. Um, but what we can do is we can apply to the Ministry of the Attorney General for short form wording, which would be basically your uh, PON, so similar to when you receive a parking ticket. Um, and we would make a recommendation as to what that fine amount would be um, through some best practice research with other municipalities, and then the Ministry of the Attorney General decides as to uh, what that fine amount will be. Thanks. Helpful. So we're going to Councillor Hill. I'm going to take a turn. Um, what is the reason, other than the fact that the survey said 51%, 
I said from 1.5% were in favor of signs in the, in the roadway allowance. What was the reason that staff didn't feel it would be uh, wiser in the long run for an outright ban on public property signs, knowing all the enforcement issues that we've had in the past? So as I already mentioned, one of the main reasons was that allowing signs on public property gives all the candidates and third party advertisers an equal opportunity for getting name recognition during their campaign. And to only allow them on private property could give an advantage to the incumbents who are already well known in the community. So part of the provisions of the Municipal Election Act talks about fairness in the whole election process. So that was one of the reasons why we were looking at that. Okay, um, thank you for, for stating that. Uh, I'll just say that, that that finding is in conflict with my own lived experience as a candidate in two elections. Um, Councillor Hill. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that because I wanted you to just use that slide as an example. So, so the two houses uh, that uh, Councillor Chappelle referred to that would might be close together, uh, would they be entitled to have a window sign? Would they be entitled to have a window sign, those homes uh, that are in that triangle? Yes, they would. Okay, thank you. Uh, and at the, if you go back to the signs on the roadway, so where it says uh, it, it, you could put the, the sign between the sidewalk and the property line, is it typical that the property line would run up to the sidewalk? In this case is no, there would be some distance between the sidewalk and the property line usually. Would the homeowners know that? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, it depends on the, on the type of road too. I mean, for example, if you get down into the older part of the city where the road allowances may be narrower than what you have typically in the newer areas, there may not be that room available. Right. Uh, but as long as they've got some room beyond the sidewalk that is a private property, then a sign could go there. So I, I know that there was a lot of uh, concern uh, expressed about the fact that uh, candidates were putting signs on the boulevard uh, that suggested that the homeowner... Uh, supported them as a private citizen. I think that you've heard that complaint, yes? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And my last uh, question then would be with respect to uh, uh, the bylaw enforcement. So do you anticipate that we will add a lot of bylaw officers during the election campaign in order to manage this? Through you? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, we're not adding additional staff. We have 12 enforcement officers, uh, but they are in zones and they will, we do have a proactive enforcement strategy. So they will be out patrolling those zones and uh, enforcing the bylaw. But you would agree that your bylaw officers are pretty busy as it is? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Yes, our, our, our staff are busy, um, but one of the things that we did do uh, with the last municipal election and also the provincial election is that we did have the campaign teams in and we provided an education to the campaign teams on the information that, some of the information that you're seeing here tonight, um, and we did find that that was, uh, that was helpful. So while I have the floor, I'd like to move an amendment. So this is only, but seeing the volume of questions and the concerns, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of questions, but I'm also hearing a lot of concerns with the bylaw uh, as proposed. So maybe we should move through to moving it so that it can be amended and deferred and other things, right? So uh, maybe I'll close questions for the time being. Remember that your questions, you, if you think of more questions, once it's on the floor, you can still ask questions. So we'll go to the members of the public section for uh, comments or questions. Are there any members of the public left? No, the Raptors game is about to start, maybe. Um, so we'll go to mover and seconder for the item to get it on the floor so that we can deal with it. Who wants to move it? I'll, uh, 
I'll okay. move it. So I, what I'm moving is that signs only be allowed on private property and all references in the uh, proposed uh, bylaw uh, that uh, reference public property be uh, removed. Okay, so that's a major amendment. Uh, I'm going to call a two-minute recess to so make sure your wording is is wish it to be for the amendment presented. Point and of order, Mr. Yes. Just to be clear, I was only moving to get it on the floor so the amendment could go forward. I wasn't suggesting I'd move that amendment. Oh, no, no right. problem. It, he will need a seconder. So, I'll I, second it. For, <laughs> second, yeah. So you're seconding. Okay. So it, it, the amendment is moved and seconded, but we've got to make sure the, the wording is correct before it's presented. So I'm going to take a two-minute recess to allow the committee member to get the wording correct with the clerk. One. Okay, so the we're at the point where Council Hill, Council Hill has a floor. He's prepared an amendment. If you want to read it out now, it's been seconded, and then we will debate it. So moving that uh, election signs on public property not be permitted, and that all references to signs on public property be removed from the proposed bylaw. So that is the proposed amendment. It's been seconded. Before we debate it, uh, maybe we get an opinion from the city clerk that as worded, it is clear and within the powers of staff and council to uh, that, that this amendment would have the effect it's intended and that its uh, direction to staff is clear. Through Mr. Chair, uh, the motion is in play. We understand it. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Hill, you have the floor on the amendment only. Thank you, and through you, Chair. I mean, I think the the, uh, the the level of restriction around the signs as proposed, and the the fact that there seems uh, to be a growing uh, sense that, uh, 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 or sorry, a, a, a growing sense that there is a, a loss of support generally for signs on public property, and a recognition that people do appreciate you know, the, the, the usefulness of election signs, but that they be restricted to, to uh, uh, private property seems to be an undercurrent in, in, in terms of the information that we received tonight. And so I think what we're do doing is just really codifying what uh, the, the general public uh, is looking for. Thank you. Let's wish to speak to the amendment. Councillor Kiley. More than that, I think in from staff tonight, we've heard that... Uh, Though these additional bylaw requirements will make it easier for campaign teams to understand, and I, again, as it's someone who's done many campaigns in the city, I can speak to the fact that they would do that. But I also think, as we heard, that would make for more enforcement and more stress on bylaws. So this is a very clear motion that will, frankly, make bylaws job much easier. Thank you, Council McLaren. Can we that the um, administrative burden will be lower? It's a question of staff, uh, bylaw staff. It's the question about workload uh, with the current bylaw as opposed to the amended bylaw. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I don't at this point see where there would be a difference between the current election sign bylaw and what's proposed here tonight. I mean, in the, as I stated previously, in the last municipal election, there was 80 to 85 um, complaints uh, that came through the licensing and enforcement division. Um, and we did find in certain areas of the city where the compliance was better, and I think it's the education, in all honesty, to the campaign teams. Um, when we had the campaign teams in for an information session that was uh, joint in partnership with our colleagues in the clerk's department, and um, you're correct, Councillor Kylie, that a lot of the campaign teams didn't understand like the site triangle and issues and just other um, items that are in the current bylaw, but we found it to be a good session. We've gone through two of them now. We've found it to be productive and we've received positive feedback from the campaign team. So I think it has helped in certain areas of the city, um, but uh, it's, I would think that there wouldn't be that, uh, wouldn't be that much of a difference in the workload. Thank you. And it, 
Anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Mr. Vice Chair, I'd like to speak to the amendment. I raise you, Mr. Chair. Chair, rather. I support the amendment. The um, part of our job as councillors is to know what the people want. We all went door to door. We all heard about signs in the campaign. We all witnessed the provincial and federal campaigns and the proliferation of signs on the public roadway. We heard the uh, comments escalate election to election. Uh, we have lived experience of using signs in our own campaigns. And we all know that a sign on a voter's lawn means one thing, and a sign on a street corner means something totally different. We all know that. One is an advertisement, another is a show of support. Now you can, you can fake support uh, by putting, cleverly putting signs on public property that look like they're, uh, they represent voters, but really we all know if you've ever run a campaign that what counts is actual support. And, um, and, and so the signs that are on private property, at least in municipal elections, are people asking for a sign or agreeing to have a sign put there if, if asked by the candidate. I know from personal experience that if I put a sign on a, can a candidate's lawn if, if, if that I kind of imposed on them or asked very assertively, that sign sometimes wasn't there the next day, right? If you, you know what I mean? Like you might, they might say yes and then they take it down themselves if, if they didn't really want it. So. To me, who are we serving by allowing signs on roadway? Really, we're serving the campaign managers of the various political parties of the various candidates. Uh, we're not really serving the residents. They will, if there are some signs, they will know which candidates are in their district. They will see the signs that are up, even if they're only on private property. Uh, and it also it sets a certain threshold that you need a, a, a enough support as a candidate to be able to get a few signs up uh, to get off the ground as a candidate. Otherwise, uh, you're in trouble. It may be slightly disadvantageous to new faces who people don't know because they can't advertise by putting signs on public property. But they do, they do have the option always of going door to door and earning sign locations the old fashioned way by asking nicely. So I'm in favor of this change. I think it's the way the, the city is going, the residents of uh, asking for this. A certain percentage of the survey respondents are obviously uh, uh, interested parties that work for political parties. So I really, if you, if you estimate that skewing the survey results by five or 10%, the actual 51% is really not a, show, a, a majority or consensus opinion. I think it's. I think we're in the minority of people that want signs on public property. That's why I agree with the, the amendment. Thank you. I re return to you. Thank you. Does anyone? Wish to, only Councilor Spell is the only one that hasn't spoken to the amendment. Do you want to speak? Okay. So the clerk is just pointing out the way that the recommendation is worded. This amendment needs to say that Exhibit A be amended, right? Yeah. That Exhibit A be amended so that signs on public property. So friendly amendment? Friendly amendment. Mr. Chair, the, the amendment to to the clause will be that Exhibit A will be amended to uh, remove or prohibit signs on public property and any, uh, any reference to that within the bylaw also be deleted. So we know how to amend that bylaw if that motion should pass. Commit, the committee clerk will, uh, will make the wording match the recommendation and that will be shown in the minutes. Okay, so we're voting on an, the amendment to remove all reference to public property from the exhibit and, yeah, that all references to signs on public property be removed from the proposed bylaw. Okay, we're gonna call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed, and that passes unanimously. So that's been amended. It's a significant change to the bylaw. 
Um, we're now discussing the bylaw as amended. Does anyone wish to speak? Councillor uh, Chappelle. I'd like to move an amendment that, that the triangle that we've discussed be reduced from 15 meters to five meters, 15 feet from the corner of a roadway is more than sufficient and will still allow me uh, to allow signs to be placed on a corner lot. So change the 15 meter triangle to five. There's another amendment for the reduction from 15 meters to five meters. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So you would need, Councillor Chappelle needs a seconder. Point of order, can I ask staff a question in order to discern if I should second uh, this? Uh, no, it needs to be seconded before can you ask a question. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a leap of faith at this point. Faith. Oh. Councilor Kali has seconded the, more, the amendment. So uh, now, you, now you're permitted, if, if you're done speaking, uh, I would go to Councilor Kali. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, to staff. Were any of the jurisdictions that you looked at, and again, I think it is in the report, I just forget off the top, were any of the other jurisdictions with site triangles using the suggested distance? Through you, Mr. Chair, the localities that we looked at, the site triangle dimensions were anywhere from five meters to the 15 meters that's here in Kingston. And sometimes it depended on the type of road. Sometimes it was a five meter triangle next to a driveway or something, but five meters was certainly uh, with some of the municipalities. All right, thank you, good. I have a question to staff on the amendment. Was there any feedback in the public consultation specifically to the size of the site triangle? No, there was not. Okay, uh, Councillor McLaren. Was there rationale for the original 15? Ms. Turner. Chair, where the 15 meters comes in is more at major intersections. So if you can think about an intersection like um, Centennial and, and Princess Street, um, where uh, you've got, obviously you've got the four corners there. Um, where we're getting a lot of complaints would have been on the south, um, south west side of that intersection where um, uh, people couldn't see at the corner when they were trying to, to turn right and there were complaints about uh, vehicular traffic and also pedestrian traffic. So um, there's, there's a bit of a difference between the um, major intersections and then maybe the, the private property um, where we see, we see less complaints. The majority of the complaints that come in are the major intersections. I just want to remind the committee that the uh, proposed bylaw has already been amended and we're recommended to council that that intersection would not have any signs permitted because that's public property. So the 15 meter, we've just heard the 15 meter rule is when public property was in play. And Councillor Kiley's amendment is speaking to the site triangle being applied to private property. I just wanna remind the committee so that we know what we're actually discussing. At this point in time, the proposed bylaw only permits signs on private property. And Councillor Kiley saying that the 15 meter site triangle, Councillor Chappelle saying that the 15 meter site triangle is too large, especially in his neighborhood. So um, just reminding the committee of, of what we're actually talking about. So next on my list was, who had their stand up? You did. Uh, through you, Chair, that's just exactly what I was going to say. If it's really an issue in the major intersections, that's public property. It's not not a problem. So in that regard, I would support Councillor Chappelle's amendment. Before we vote, I was going to ask, uh, so with the, with the lens of private property only, is five meters, uh, having a five meter side triangle going to be a safety hazard for motorists? It would, I guess it would depend on the intersection, whether it becomes a safety hazard. The five meters is still gonna be measured along the curb line 
or the edge of the pavement. So in, in ma at major intersections, that five meters is gonna be within the, the public realm. But when you get into subdivisions, residential subdivisions, the five meters could very well impact the private property and whether or not that five meters is sufficient if there's a large sign placed on the private property in terms of obstructing sight lines, uh, I'm not really sure. Does anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Yeah, call the question on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? That also passes unanimously. It's been amended twice. Does anyone else wish to speak to the twice amended recommendation? Councillor Chappell. But, uh, we have public act properties. I would like to move an amendment that the distancing is removed uh, between signs and so that row houses and, and residential communities, if they wish to demonstrate support, they can have, their neighbors can demonstrate their support as well and not be restricted by having a site uh, barrier in between them. So I'd like to remove that we would uh, remove that uh, restriction of the bylaw. Okay, um, we do so. Amassing staff, is such an amendment necessary if the, if this, if the amended bylaw Amended recommendation passes council, and the recommendation is, is for signs only on private property. Is the 10 meter restriction, would it be intact and would it still be in there? The 10 meters would still be there. So the councillors, in, in, a, in a situation where the frontage is less than 10 meters, the 10 meter restriction would be a restriction on individual property owners, or potentially could be. Yes. Okay. So we need a seconder for Councillor Chappelle's amendment, Councillor McLaren, that the 10 meter restriction be removed. Is that, is that it? Okay. You got that? Okay. Any debate? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That also carries unanimously. Anyone else wish to speak to the thrice amended recommendation? So I just want to remind the committee that we're, we're trying to represent all of council here tonight. We go into more detail with less of us, but at the end of the day, it starts to pass council. So if you think of any more amendments, make sure you're, you think you can get support when it comes to the council table. Any other proposed? Councillor Chappelle. Yes, I heard my fellow councillors in rather larger properties and, um, and would like to be able to install more than one sign. So two signs, I think, would be a reasonable limit on private property. So I'm just thinking from a logical point of view, can I maybe ask a question to staff? On larger properties, as it stands now without an amendment, if you had 100 meters of frontage, you would still only be able to put up one sign, is that correct? If the property was residential, that's correct. If it's non-residential, then it's two signs per, front, per candidate or third-party advertiser. You were referring to residential properties, large, like in countryside and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So, so you're, the amendment is to remove the a change the restriction from one to two on residential. Uh, there were some had the, the limitation of two for residential and three for um, commercial properties. And I would move that we would have the same mandate because there was a number of communities. I think there were five communities that had that limitation. And I think that ours was more restrictive than what was researched in the great work that they did. Is that your amendment? Two and three? So you got that? Uh, consultation with uh, Councillor Hill, two and two would be fine. Councillor Hill, are you in this amendment? So I, I think it would say that the 
bylaw be amended to allow two signs per residential frontage? Okay, debate on this amendment. Councillor McLaren. Uh, this seems a little excessive with sign pollution. And uh, when we remove the 10 meter thing, that's plenty, I think. Uh, so I won't be supporting this. Councillor Kyle. Yeah, further to that, in context of the upcoming federal election, and this is relevant, so bear with me for 10 seconds, there's a poll done uh, by ECOS last week that said, of the four main political parties, they're all tied in potential voter intent. So, say you have that applied to households in Kingston, that could be four signs per lawn already. So if we double the allowance, I mean, some of these rural residential places could have up to eight signs. I think, as Councillor McLaren said, that kind of goes against the spirit of everything we've just done. So I will not support it. Thank you. I agree that that could happen. It's pretty unlikely. I mean, we certainly didn't see a lot of evidence of that around the uh, city in, at the, in the elect, last election campaign. My concern is more that what we're effectively doing is saying to a business owner that uh, you have, uh, you know, twice the say of a resident. And I don't think that's fair. And I, and I think that uh, although it's very unlikely that people are going are gonna to engage in, in multiple signs on their front lawn, tough enough to get them to put one on there, uh, I suspect that uh, at, at least this levels the playing field for all residents and business owners in the city. So I would support the motion. Mr. Vice Chair, will you, uh, I would like to speak to the amendment. Actually, no, it can't be you. Uh, Councillor Hill, the chair. I take this, recognize you. Yeah, can't pass the chair to the mover. Um, I actually can see both sides. I'm, I'm fairly ambivalent one way or the other. I'm trying to think what, what downtown residents would say. They would say nobody puts two signs on their property downtown. But, but if, if you've got a, commercial frontage on Princess Street and, you're, and you've got two signs and then someone's got a res residential frontage and they're only allowed one, that's not fair. So I think I, think I on the balance, have to side with Councillor Spell's amendment and I will support it. Thank you. Oh, I return the chair. Okay, the amendment. All those in favor? All those opposed? It passes three to two. Okay, now we have four amendments, all passed, and we have a recommendation to go to council. Any further debate? We'll call the question on the recommendation. So just to be clear, this is the recommendation from the package, and Mr. Clerk, could you remind the committee uh, how it looks today. Yep, so essentially Exhibit A will be amended to remove, um, or sorry, to prohibit uh, signs being placed on public property as well. The bylaw will be amended to remove all references to signs being placed on public property. The second amendment uh, dealt with the 15 meter site triangle being reduced to five meters. The third amendment uh, effectively reduced the 10 meter restriction from private property because public property is no longer in play. And finally, um, the bylaw or exhibit A is also being amended to permit two signs on residential property in order for the number of signs to be comparable with commercial properties. Okay, call the question on the amended rec uh, recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. That was relatively quick considering how many amendments there were. What time is it, Mr. Clerk? So my wife wanted me home half an hour ago to, to be there with my six-year-old because she had to go out. So she's basically now late for her outing. Um, we'll move on to the next item, which is item F and does anyone mind if I go home? 
Okay, so Councillor Chappelle is going to take over. I made enough trouble as it is. Thank you very much. We're on to item F, a review of uh, city bylaws, annual review of bylaws. So I'd like to call upon the city clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're once again still pleased to be here tonight, even after those uh, minor amendments to the previous recommendation. But uh, in 2011, the city of Kingston developed an annual process for identifying, listing, and reviewing bylaws, which might be considered obsolete or in need of being updated. The inventory has been updated annually and provided to the Administrative Policies Committee for information. Our initial goal was six to eight bylaws being reviewed annually. Under this process, we've reviewed 92 bylaws to date. Six in 2003, six in 2014, six in 2015, 27 in 2016, a high of 36 in 2017, and 11 in 2018. So the average has been 15 bylaws per year. So the purpose of this report is to provide the listing of all bylaws which were reviewed in 2018 and the ongoing nature of the review process. In 2018, 11 bylaws were either confirmed as adequate or sanctioned changes were made were necessary. The balance uh, have been incorporated into departmental scorecards and work plans and scheduled for review in 2019 uh, or 2020. 15 bylaws have been identified for this process. The periodic review of corporate bylaws helps to mitigate risk and ensure that bylaws are up to date and in accordance with any applicable federal and provincial legislations. Our team is here to answer any questions on this information report that the committee may have. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? No, no comments on Thank you. Uh, we're gonna... So at this time, we're going to resolve into the Board of Management and uh, ad address uh, the Rideau Crest home. We just need a motion from the committee to resolve into the board management. So, Councilor Kiley and McLaren. Councilor Kiley, Councilor McLaren. All in favor? All in favor, Councilor Hill. Councilor Hill. Councilor Hill. <laughs> uh, we have a motion on the floor to move into the, resolve into the uh, board of management. All those in favor? Thank you. I'd like to call on uh, Ms. Kinney. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. The report before you tonight contains information from March 2019 through to the end of April. Reader Crest Home maintained an overall occupancy rate of 98.78 for January through to April. Over the course of this reporting period, Reader Crest had two incidents and three complaints reportable to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. One of the critical incidents was a respiratory outbreak declared by KF LNA Public Health Unit on April 20th on our first floor. There were 11 cases of upper respiratory symptoms during the course of this outbreak that were in keeping with the case definition. The outbreak was confirmed as influenza A from cultures tested. There were two residents hospitalized and no deaths occurred as a result of this outbreak. The outbreak was declared over on May 2nd and there were no cases affecting staff during this outbreak. The Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care was in the home during the month of April. During the course of this inspection, they inquired about one complaint as well as critical incidents submitted through the course of 2019. The report was issued in May and as a result, the home received four written notifications to which voluntary plans of correction have been completed. The notifications were related to care plans surrounding falls, admission care conferences, and an applicant refusal letter. The home has completed an action plan for all findings. As of April 2019, there were 425 people on the wait list for the home. 
of which 18 were in crisis awaiting placement. The home continues to work on the replacement of flooring on both the third and fourth floors. This project began in April of this year and is expected to be completed by the end of summer. Upon completion of these two floors, the home will be looking to begin the same work on the first and second floors. Rito Crest submitted our annual quality improvement plan to Health Quality Ontario in March. The home's quality improvement plan outlines goals for the home, which focuses on improving resident and family satisfaction, decreasing emergency room visits, palliative care, improving resident safety, and decreasing antipsychotic use. As of the end of April of 2019, Rito Crest Home has spent 30.97% of its municipal contribution, excluding commitments, which is $137,000 under budget. Timing differences contributing to the underspent include timing of payroll costs, which are typically higher in the summer months due to vacation coverage, and higher in the last month of the fiscal year due to timing of two statutory holidays and lieu bank payouts. I'm happy to answer any questions if there is any. Any questions for Ms. Carley? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You mentioned the, the renovations, redoing the floor. During our strategic planning, we voted to defer some other maintenance at Rideau Crest. Will that have any adverse impact on residents? So during the, the flooring project itself, the, the funds are there to complete that project for the entire home. Um, deferral was made for resident washrooms and not the whole amount was deferred, uh, but there was a portion of $2 million that was deferred out to later years to have that renovation completed. And in the meantime, are the current facilities that won't be renovated because of that deferral adequate? Sorry, there are uh, health and safety and infection control concerns we do have with the current state of the resident washrooms as well as the current state of the resident bathroom and shower rooms, tub rooms. Yes. Thank you. Thank you to you. The 18 people that are in crisis awaiting placements, what? typically uh, would be the alternative for those folks? Through you, Mr. Chair, clients are either in home and have community care and or have family that are with them 24 hours a day, which can no longer have the ability to stay with them. Um, some of them end up in, a, in the emergency room and have no place to go. Um, so those are the crisis that need to get placed because the support is not there to, to house them. Any further questions? So I need someone to move a motion to rise from the Board of Management. Councillor McLaren, Councillor Kiley, all those in favor? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Keyes. We have one item of correspondence to reference. This is received from Nathan Richard of Patria Enterprises dated May 22, 2019 regarding the City of Kingston's vacancy tax rebate. It was on schedule page 309. I'm sure you've all read it. Um, and then a motion to adjourn. Oh, Councillor McLeod, you're fast. <laughs>